Okay, good morning. I think that we will begin in a minute. There should be some pioneer's preference for people who arrive, who arrive on time, right? Um, right. <laughs> yeah. It's from the Chief Judge of the Milwaukee County Circuit Court. It must be the law in this area now. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of Marquette University Law School to welcome you this morning. My high-minded purposes in these opening remarks include such things as giving you an opportunity to wake up at this early hour and also reminding you to turn off your cell phones. So to be sure, I do hope to do a little bit more than that to provide some context for this morning's conference. Over the past decade, the law school has developed what we have tended to call our public policy initiative. We convene dozens of events each year, typically in this room, but in any number of forms. Often they are entries in the On the Issues with Mike Goucher series over the noon hour. Other times we host debates between candidates for elections. The most recent was just last Friday, a debate here in this room broadcast statewide live between the candidates for the Wisconsin Supreme Court. Still other times we host conferences on important issues facing the region and the state. And since 2012, the law school has offered through the leadership of Professor Charles Franklin, its director, the Marquette Law School poll. We have sought to provide a deep look into issues and perceptions that drive politics and elections in the state. All of these various activities have prompted the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel to describe Marquette Law School as Milwaukee's public square. Although, Mr. Haynes, that was a few years ago that that, that term was used. So if you want to use that again so that uh, in my invitations to people I can say 2018, that would be terrific. Um, last April, based on all of this, but primarily looking forward, we announced the creation of the Lubar Center for Public Policy Research and Civic Education, supported by a most generous endowment from Shell and Marianne Lubar. This past October, the Lubar Center set out on a long-term initiative, which we call our Milwaukee Area Project. The Milwaukee Area Project seeks over time to present a comprehensive examination of public opinion, public policy, and conditions throughout this region. Our role is descriptive rather than prescriptive, focusing on providing the best information available about conditions and opportunities, and inviting public discussion of the full range of proposals to address those conditions and expand those opportunities. Today's is the second conference as part of the Milwaukee Area Project. It invites us to focus on the role of local nonprofit organizations in improving the quality of life in neighborhoods, especially in the city of Milwaukee, but also across the metropolitan region more generally. For this purpose, we do welcome back to Eckstein Hall, Professor Patrick Sharkey. He is Professor of Sociology at New York University and was here less than two years ago discussing his book on the impact of neighborhoods on inequality. His new book, Uneasy Peace, discusses the dramatic reduction of crime in urban areas beginning in the early 1990s and some of the factors that have brought this change about. One of those is the role that nonprofit organizations play in reducing crime. We think that this element is especially important because it represents not external efforts such as policing or the rise and fall of drug use, but rather efforts by community members to address their local conditions. I would add that while crime may have changed over time, the weather has not, and we are most grateful to Professor Sharkey for changing his plans as late as yesterday, both to arrive earlier and to leave later than planned, simply in order to ensure that this conference could go on as scheduled. Our area here in Milwaukee is enriched by the wide variety of organizations dedicated to the improvement of our collective well-being. The Law School's Marquette Legal Initiative for Nonprofit Corporations, or MLINC, which provides free brief legal advice for qualifying nonprofits, has cataloged more than 3,000 nonprofits in Milwaukee area activities. Many of you here today are taking an 
morning away from doing extraordinary work through such organizations, and we are very grateful for not only your presence here today, but your work every day. In fact, in developing today's conference, we here at the Law School have collaborated with Susan Lloyd, who is the Executive Director of the Zilber Family Foundation, and Katie Sanders, who is the Executive Director of Safe and Sound. Their insights into how we might best approach today's topics have been invaluable. After Mike Goucher and Professor Sharkey lead us through an overview of his work, we will want to turn to Susan, Katie, and representatives of other Milwaukee organizations that are working to improve our neighborhoods and communities. And so without more, let me turn the program over to my colleague, Mike Goucher, who serves here as Distinguished Fellow in Law and Public Policy, and our guest, Professor Sharkey. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Dean Kearney, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, we appreciate you being with us at uh, the Lubar Center here at Eckstein Hall. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a great day of conversation and talking about what works in reducing crime and improving neighborhoods. And we begin today with our conversation with Patrick Sharkey. Professor Sharkey, as, as the dean mentioned, was here uh, just uh, several years ago. And um, this time he's, he's here to talk about uh, his new book and, and his observations on what's happened to crime in America. The name of the book, in case you haven't seen it, is called Uneasy Peace, The Great Crime Decline, The Renewal of City Life, and The Next War on Violence. So today what I'd like to do is we'll talk with Professor Sharkey a little bit about um, what has happened in terms of the decline in crime. Uh, some of the numbers around the country are pretty stunning, pretty astonishing. We'll talk about why Crime has declined in many American cities. Um, and then we will talk about a new model for uh, uh, working toward reducing crime even further. Uh, because Professor Sharkey believes that, that, that we're going to have to look at that as we move forward if we want to continue to uh, see crime rates decline in America. So Professor, it's good to have you back here. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, you started this book in 2014. Uh, 2014, historically speaking, was a pretty interesting year for American cities. How so? Yeah, it was, well, first let me say thanks to everyone, A, for inviting me back, and, and B, for coming out, you know, uh, a couple of years ago when I was here, this was just one of the most energizing trips I had uh, in talking about my previous book, and it, it was really fun to engage with the community uh, in, in, in the way that it, that it went down here, and so I'm, I'm so grateful that you all came out Again, I was very excited to come back. Um, yeah, so I started really writing this in, in, in 2014 after years of research. And you know, I didn't realize it when I started writing it, but that was a, a unique year. That was a historical year. It was, so the homicide rate, I'll, I'll talk about the homicide rate a lot. It was, it was it, across the nation as a whole, it was about 4.4 homicides per every 100,000 people in the US. Now, it, the, murder rate was falling steadily to that point, and that was basically as, as low as it got. Um, the interesting thing is that, you know, 2014, people didn't realize it, but it was one of the safest years in the history of the country. Uh, maybe the safest year. Uh, we don't have great data going back, but could have been the safest year in the history of the country, and that, uh, that just hadn't sunk in across the country. So I started writing this book because I was doing lots and lots of research showing that as violence falls, a whole range of aspects of city life changed. A whole set of dimensions of urban inequality had changed, and I, I didn't think that had really set in, uh, that many cities across the country had become new, entirely different places. So that's when I started writing the book, and then since then, a lot has, has gone on uh, that has made the book a little bit more complex and added uh, different puzzles and challenges. Um, but it was that starting point, 2014, when violence was, was still falling. It was one of the safest years in the country. New York City seemed calm and, and peaceful. That's when the book began. And we should point out that, that the, this decline in crime does vary from city to city. There are some cities that have experienced uh, outcomes that are not as, as promising as what we've seen on a larger scale. Yeah, so even at that time, there were, you know, Newark, uh, uh, half an hour west, um, had, had not experienced the same drop in violence that New York City had. So that's a puzzle in and of itself. They, Newark and New York City looked very similar in the early 1990s in, ter in terms of their crime rates. Uh, New York City, uh, the rate had plummeted. New York, Newark had stayed the same. Uh, Milwaukee in 2014, 
uh, had shown a, a pretty substantial decline in, in violence, not at the same degree as New York or Dallas or Minneapolis and St. Paul, um, but a pretty substantial decline in violence. Again, uh, we've seen not just in Milwaukee, but in a bunch of cities, we've seen a subsequent rise uh, uh, in 2015 and 2016 when I was here. Um, and that's, so that point, that was kind of, that was a point when, and I should have realized it, because in 2014, in that summer, uh, we were at this historic low point in terms of violence, but it was also the summer that Eric Garner was killed in Staten Island, uh, choked to death by, by an officer in New York. Um, it was, it was a, a summer when uh, Mayor de Blasio entered office in New York and decided that the longstanding practice of stop, question, frisk, which had really been a dominant policing strategy in New York, was going to end. 700,000 kids were stopped uh, in 2011 across New York City, uh, a hugely disproportionate share of them uh, being uh, young black and Latino kids. Uh, Mayor de Blasio said, okay, he ran on a campaign saying this has to stop. There was, so Eric Garner was happening. Later, Dontre Hamilton happened here. Uh, across the country, there was growing recognition that this old model that we've relied on to deal with violent crime, model that relies on the prison and the police to deal with this problem uh, was unsustainable and was coming to an end. And that, so that was kind of the context. So there's a, a, an element of fragility to, to this decline. This is the uneasy, uneasy piece, piece exactly, that you, you yes. talk about. Uh, you said that uh, for some cities, a decline in crime, and, and this is, is uh, astonishing, is, is a word that we've used uh, a couple of times, but it has literally transformed cities. In what sense have they been transformed? Yeah, well, from the 1970s to the 1990s, I think it was fair to say that most big cities across the country were characterized by violence. Okay, violence and city life became linked, at least in the public's consciousness, and in many cases in reality. Uh, about half of, of cities across the country had murder rates at least 20 per 100,000 or, or higher. You know, these are, are murder rates that are seen in the most violent nations in the world, and this was common uh, from the 1970s through the 1990s. Uh, since that point, uh, it has become much less common. So, so as we've noted, you know, a transformation hasn't taken place everywhere, but in, in many big cities, um, New York, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, uh, San Diego has transformed, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., many others. Uh, there has been an utter and complete transformation in the nature of, of city life. New York is unrecognizable to people who moved away in 1990 and, and come back. Um, and, and so this degree of, of transformation is, is pretty astonishing. And my, my argument is it basically uh, means that in much of America, city life is no longer linked with violence. That connection is no longer uh, valid. In, in most of the country, cities are no longer dangerous. And this is the first time we've been able to say this in several decades. It's hard to say it here in Milwaukee because Milwaukee still has an extreme level of violence, still has a rate up near 20 uh, per 100,000. Um, but if we're, if we're talking about the nation as a whole, most cities are no longer dangerous. And that's one of the big messages of the book. Let's talk about the consequences when crime falls, when crime is reduced dramatically. You point to several outcomes, and, and they're truly uh, uh, fascinating. First of all, it's, it's kids in school, how they perform in school. When violence is reduced, what happens to, to kids? Yeah, well, the first, the first piece that I want to point out is just that we have new evidence over the past 10 years or so indicating the severity of the damage that violence does, uh, meaning when, when kids live in violent environments, and a lot of you in the room are going to say, yeah, you know, we knew this, we don't need you to tell, tell us this, but the evidence that we now have about the impact of community violence, not just individuals who are victimized, but the impact of, of spending one's life in a violent environment uh, is enormous. And, and I can talk in detail about that evidence, but it is new evidence in the past 10 years. Data-driven evidence. Yeah, yes, the yes. burden that kids carry with them as they enter the, the classroom setting uh, with violence on their minds. Um, so, you know, that's the first piece. We, we, we just have better evidence than, than before about how damaging violence is. Now the second piece, which is the more hopeful part, is that when violence falls, we have reassuring evidence that, that a whole range of dimensions of kids' lives and of 
communities' experiences transform as, as well. So the, the most obvious way to, tell, uh, to make this point is to look at lives lost. Um, and and there are, you know, as the homicide rate falls, tens of thousands of lives are preserved. This is you know, easy to make the case in a statistical sense, but when you think about each incident of violence and the horror and the tragedy that goes with it, then this is, this is actually, you know, I think of as one of the most important points of the book. We're talking about tens of thousands of lives saved, preserved, young people who are able to start a family, able to enter the workforce because they are not being killed. Okay, so this is a national story. Now, when, when I drill down and I talk about life expectancy uh, in, in the book, and we, we still have enormous inequalities in this basic measure of public health, life expectancy, how long we can expect to live. Um, but, you know, it, I think it's also important to acknowledge the changes that have taken place in the past 20 years. So we did a, a thought experiment uh, with a, a former doctoral student, Michael Friedson, where, where we, we uh, generated measures of life expectancy for four different groups, uh, uh, black and white men and women. Okay, and um, uh, so we, we constructed life tables and calculated life expectancy for each of these four groups. And then we did the same exercise fixing the homicide rate to its level in 1991. So the thought experiment is what if crime never fell? What would life expectancy be like? And, and what, we, what we found was that if the homicide rate never fell, then the life expectancy of black men would be about 0.8 years lower. So almost a full year lower than what it is right now. And I say that and, and it's kind of an underwhelming uh, uh, point to make, but this is an enormous difference. It is Jane. extremely mm. difficult, extremely rare for any medical intervention, any social change to generate this degree of, of change in life expectancy. The example that I like to use is to compare it to the obesity epidemic, um, which we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on, everyone recognizes as a national uh, uh, crisis. And yet researchers who study uh, obesity have estimated that if this epidemic went away tomorrow, if not a single person across the country was overweight tomorrow, uh, then life expectancy would be expected to increase by about three quarters of a year, okay? So by about the same amount that we've seen among black men do purely to the decline in homicide. So that's the, that's the scale of change we're talking about. We don't usually, or we don't always, I know in Milwaukee you think of violence as a public health issue. That, that's not true in a lot of the country, um, but I think it's, it's been uh, probably the most important advancement in public health for black men in particular over the past several decades. Uh, improvements in life expectancy, uh, improved test scores uh, for students, in the classroom, better chances for kids who grow up in poverty to rise into the middle class, all linked to a reduction in crime. Yeah, thanks, thanks for, um, for raising it. I mean, this was, this was the empirical meat of the, the book. We spent five or six years gathering uh, national data on these different m measures of, of inequality. And, and I mean, you're exactly right. So you start with lives lost, but it's not just about lives lost. Um, it, schools have become dramatically safer. I know that it's hard to convince people of that when we've seen these mass shootings take place. But if you look at the everyday experience of students in the, in the US, then victimization at school has fallen by 75% since the early 1990s. Uh, so across the country, black students used to report the highest rates of carrying a weapon to school. Now they report the lowest rates out of, uh, relative to whites and Hispanics. Um, uh, the, the, proportion of kids who report feeling safe at school uh, uh, has, has increased dramatically over, over time. Um, this has translated into improved academic performance. So at the, the places that have seen the greatest declines in violence are the places that have seen the greatest improvements in academic achievement. They are also the places that have seen the greatest narrowing of achievement gaps, racial achievement gaps. Um, it's not just uh, in the schools, as he said, we then follow kids later in life and look at how uh, the crime drop has affected uh, upward mobility, and we find that kids growing up in poor families uh, are much more likely to move out of poverty, to move into the middle class, if they live in a place that has become safer over time. Now, the, the one point I want to make here is that this is, this is years of research where we are making causal estimates. So this is not just saying, okay, in places that have done better, kids are doing better. 
Uh, we, are, we are are harnessing natural experiments and, and shocks on the on the level of violence in order to make these causal claims. Um, so, you know, for the folks in the room who are, are skeptical of that, you know, there's a methodological supplement that goes with the, the book that has all the original articles and all the original data. And I think that's fundamental. This is not, you know, how I think the world works. This is based on, on years of research that uh, happened before I wrote the book, and the book is kind of the synthesis of that. So uh, a number of cities around the country have been transformed, and the big question uh, is why? And it's, it's not a simple answer. There are different factors involved. How much of it is, for example, improved policing strategies, higher rates of incarceration that went into effect in the early 90s, um, Give us a sense of, of what's behind the decline. Yeah, so this is a challenging question. There's a chapter three in the book deals with this question. But what I argue is that there, there are a whole bunch of, of, of theories about why crime fell, and I don't dismiss any of them, but what, what I argue is much more straightforward. So in the early 1990s, there was a national mobilization against violence. Uh, people had cared and noticed uh, the increase in violence for a long time, but something different happened in the 1990s. The example I like to use is, is the Gallup poll that asked what's the most pressing problem facing the nation. And this question has been asked since the 1930s. Uh, in 1994, for the first time in the history of that poll, violent crime was, was the, the top answer. Uh, more than half of Americans thought crime was, a, was the most pressing issue facing the country. This is, this is the time period when Democrats embraced uh, crime uh, uh, prevention, incarceration, uh, mandatory minimum sentencing uh, as part of their platform. So it was the first time that kind of the entire political community, most of the country, really focused on violence as a national crisis. The reason I, I start with that as a preface is because I think the changes that took place are represent a national mobilization, and that took many different forms. It took uh, the form of an expansion of policing uh, and a change in the tactics of policing. So policing became much more aggressive. Uh, police forces expanded. Uh, the expansion of police reduced crime. Um, it, this, is, this is, you know, we have really good evidence on this question. When there are more police on the street, crime goes down. It's an uncomfortable reality. It is, it, it, I am convinced that the evidence is, is, is strong enough to make that conclusion. Uh, there was an expansion of car incarceration. Um, we have not quite as strong evidence, but pretty good evidence that incarceration, at least the, the scale up uh, from the, in the uh, 1980s and into the early 90s, reduced crime. Okay, it came with a whole bunch of other costs, but it reduced crime. Um, what happened at that period is that public spaces transformed. Okay, uh, gang activity was, was uh, um, uh, pursued ruthlessly and aggressively. Open air drug markets were shut down. Uh, the police became more uh, prevalent uh, and they became more aggressive. Prosecutors became more aggressive. Um, private security proliferated. Schools started implementing, you know, installing uh, surveillance systems and metal detectors. Entire cities started installing uh, uh, video camera systems. Uh, you know, private, like, uh, homeowners. Uh, installed video video camera systems, low jack into their cars, and, and so forth. Um, so w the argument that I make in the book is that there was a complete transformation of, of public space. And there's one additional piece that is typically ignored in these discussions, which is that there was a mobilization among residents and community organizations in the neighborhoods hit hardest by violence that happened at the same time. An explosion in the number of organizations. So in the 1980s, the nonprofit sector was starved. Was starved. It was. It was. It was barely functional. Uh, in the 1990s, the nonprofit sector it, it proliferated, um, and this hasn't entered in dis into discussions about why crime fell. But I think it's a crucial piece. So what we did is we looked at the full population, the full census of nonprofits in cities across the country, and again we developed methods to identify the causal impact that, that these organizations had on crime. And what we found is really strong evidence that in cities where the nonprofit sector expanded, where, where you had new organizations that were specifically focused on building stronger neighborhoods, on confronting crime and violence, on dealing with issues like reentry, uh, addiction, um, generating after school centers, even generating business improvement districts, which are you know, a part of this uh, expansion in the nonprofit sector, 
these activities had a causal impact and a substantial impact on the level of violence. Okay, so when I talk about the transformation, this is a long-winded answer, I'm sorry about this, but um, when I talk about the transformation of public space, I'm talking about a range of different activities and actors who came together to retake public spaces. That included the police, that included uh, other uh, actors within the criminal justice system. Um, but it also included the residents mobilized into local organizations who decided to take back their neighborhoods, okay? So it's a set of forces that I'm sure everyone in the room thinks of some as positive and some as negative. The argument in the book is that they all came together at a similar time, and that's the most plausible explanation for why violence started to fall. Is there a reason why the, the role of, of nonprofits, the role of community organizations, was somehow overlooked prior to, to the writing of this book? I think it's easy to dismiss the work going on in local communities. A, their local organizations are doing all kinds of different things, so it's hard to pinpoint exactly what is effective and what is not. But when you look at this mass explosion, as, as you refer to it, of, of community organizations that were specifically trying to take back their neighborhoods, you know, we were able to get the Urban Institute collected national data on this, so we were able to look at, at the full population for the first time and really try to, to develop methods to see how these, whether these organizations were effective. And I think it's the first time that uh, someone has done that, tried to really take it, you know, the study of nonprofits from case studies of individual organizations to a national study to see how this, this proliferation affected violence. Um, and I think the work that's being done on the ground is easy to dismiss. It's, it's, it's simpler to develop a counterintuitive, you know, uh, somewhat sensational theory about why violence fell instead of looking to the people who have actually devoted their, their lives to, to making sure it falls. Uh, one of the things you do in this book is you, you talk about, you believe in order to keep reducing crime in this country that, that we need a new model. Um, uh, for reducing crime. And, and I think it's fair to say that you believe the days of uh, large numbers of individuals being incarcerated, those days are going to soon be history, that we're moving away from that. Is that correct? Well, it's going to take a while, but um, I, think, I think that model, the model of dealing with the problem of, of urban violence and all the problems that come with it, really the problem of urban poverty more generally, dealing with that through a model of punishment, through a model of relying on the prisons and, and, and the police to dominate public spaces, uh, I think that model has broken down. Um, I think that model is not sustainable. Uh, and, and over the past few years, it has become increasingly visible uh, to people who live outside of the most disadvantaged communities what goes on uh, in those neighborhoods and, and kind of the, the approaches that have been used for a long time uh, to control violence. Um, and so, yeah, as that model has broken down, and it started to break down with, with the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, this, this movement brought attention to, to what was going on uh, uh, in the most disadvantaged neighborhoods uh, in the country. Um, uh, it became more visible as more and more people uh, recorded people getting shot, uh, unarmed, unarmed uh, individuals being, being shot. And, and, you know, the rest of the country got a glimpse of, of what's been happening for a long time. Uh, the issue now is what's been happening for a long time no longer resonates with the actual experience of, of, of crime in cities. So, uh, you know, one, one exercise I did, I looked at uh, homicide due to all different causes, and I just charted trends over time. And what I found is that every form of homicide has fallen since the 1990s. The one exception was, was police-related. Uh, homicides had not fallen. And in fact, there's some evidence that they have increased uh, more recently. So that, mm -hmm. that tells me, yeah, this, this model is unsustainable. Uh, um, a new model is coming. And the, and the real question is, what will that new model look like? Well, one uh, uh, idea of, of a new model, uh, and one that you talk about in this book, is being used by the New York City Police Department, which uh, during the 90s and early 2000s was very aggressive yep. in its policing strategies. Um, they were using something called CopStat, which is something that, that Milwaukee has used too. It's very data-driven. Um, uh, and uh, you saw something in New York, a new way of policing called neighborhood stat. What is the difference, and why do you think that could be the model 
for future uh, uh, efforts to reduce crime. Yeah, Neighborhood Stat is an inspiring program. It, it, for, just let me provide a quick description. So this is actually, Liz, Liz, Elizabeth Glazer is um, in the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, and she really dreamed this up. Blasio's um, office. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the idea behind Neighborhood Stat is, uh, are people familiar with CompStat? Those, okay, so basic idea is to bring uh, the police department together in a room, look at precise data on where crime is, is rising, and then hold people accountable. Okay, what's going on on that block? What's going on in your beat? And, and, and it's, so it's a management system that really tracks crime on a very precise level uh, and, and brings everyone together to deal with those short-term fluctuations. Okay, neighborhood status built on that same idea, but uh, what they've done in the same room, in the CompStat room in, in, uh, at One Police Plaza in New York, uh, they have brought together a whole range of actors uh, within a, a neighborhood. Usually they're organized around public housing developments and, and the, the few that have remained uh, violent places in, in New York. Um, and when I say all different actors, I mean social service organizations, uh, representatives of the police department, uh, sanitation, uh, representatives of, of the housing authority, uh, community leaders, uh, residents, uh, tenants organizations, um, all in the same room with the same model as CompStat where, where data is put up on monitors overhead. Uh, people are looking not just at crime but at other indicators of what's happening on the ground uh, around the development. Discussions range from crime and gang activity to uh, broken locks uh, on the housing developments and Litter. garbage, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, places where garbage is being dumped. And everyone in the room is held accountable for, well, why aren't more kids signed up for summer jobs programs? Okay, we've had this open for a week. How come kids haven't signed up? Uh, who, who's reaching out to the kids to get them? You know, why, is, why has this garbage uh, dump, why is this uh, space in front of the building become a, a spot for garbage and air conditioners to be dumped? You know, so the, the representative from sanitation has to answer, has to respond. And the idea here is that what, we're, what they're trying to do is not just solve the problem of violence in isolation, but think about what is where are the problems emerging in that, in that community? Uh, where are the spaces that are becoming trouble spots? Where are, the, where are the vulnerable spots within that neighborhood? And they're bringing everyone within the community together, not just the police department, but everyone in the community is responsible uh, for dealing with these problems. So, so it's trying to reduce violence, but also trying to build a stronger foundation. Uh, and that's the idea behind Neighborhood Stat. Uh, the meetings I've gone to have been in, in, incredibly inspiring. Um, I think it's, I think, you know, in terms of uh, the capacity of bringing the police department together with residents to confront social problems, I think it is a, a reflection of what the next model of policing can be. You make a case for, for something you call new urban guardians. Who are the new urban guardians? When, when you talk about that, what, what do you mean? Well, I make a call for new urban guardians. So the idea is that public space has been dominated by the police, and that's been true in most cities across the country for the past several decades. Uh, we've relied way too much on the police, not because they're not effective, but because they've been asked to deal with every social problem that, that is present in, in our cities, including mental health, including addiction, including domestic violence, um, including reentry, you know, homelessness. So, We've asked the police to deal with all of these problems for the past several decades because these, the other actors who can play some role, the other organizations who can play some role, have never had the same commitment, the same resources that the police department has had. Um, so what I argue is we need a broader set of guardians. We need a broader set of, of actors within a community who can look out over public space, make sure everyone in that neighborhood is taken care of, make sure when people have problems or when they're coming home from a late shift at work, that there's someone there to greet them, that, that they feel safe uh, when they walk home, that kids can walk into community centers and feel safe and be sure that they're not uh, going to, to be victimized on, on the way. Uh, we need a new set, a broader set of actors who can look out over public space, and that's, that's what I mean when I refer to the new set of urban, urban guardians. I argue that, the, you know, 
and I'm very supportive of, of police departments. I think police departments should get more resources. I think their jobs are incredibly stressful. I think they, they need resources to develop a new style of policing. But I also argue that we need to extend this commitment to other uh, organizations and individuals within communities who can play a bigger role in looking out over public space and, and making sure that everyone in that public space is taken care of. Uh, how do we coordinate efforts to improve communities? Because you may have in, in a specific community, I think of Imani, for instance, uh, there are a lot of uh, nonprofits doing good work in that community. Yeah. Does it need to be funneled into one uh, organization that sort of uh, designs it, sets the agenda, or can everybody operate sort of in their own world and still be effective? Yeah, well, I think there are multiple models. Um, you know, when I was when I was here a couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to take a tour of the city with with Susan Lloyd and with John Gerda. And and you know what I noticed, I was peppering them with questions uh, throughout the the tour. But what I noticed is that there are certain neighborhoods where it's clear that there's an organization or a set of organizations who look out over that neighborhood. And the, I think the best sister Patricia Rogers is, is here. I think the best example, which I, I mentioned in the book, is when I was. Uh, we were approaching the Dominican Center, uh, and I noticed, you know, there are a lot of abandoned homes in Milwaukee. That's a that's a serious problem here. Uh, and on one block, I noticed that one of the homes with plywoods on the windows had a beautiful paint job and and looked very nice, even though it was clearly uh, abandoned. And I asked her about it, and it turned out that she had someone uh, paint the the home. So the you know the plywood had had uh, uh, you know beautiful curtains painted onto it and, and, and shutters, and uh, to me that's like that's crucial because that's a sign that this this block is watched over, this block is taken care of. People are are not letting the you, you're not on your own if you live on this block or if you walk on this block. Uh, there are I don't want to say eyes on the street, but there are people who are taking responsibility for that space. Um, and so, you know, that's an example of urban gardens. But there were some places, you know, throughout the city that where we drove down the streets and there was no one in charge. Um, and I would ask Susan and I would ask John, you know, what's going on around here? And there wasn't much going on. Uh, and those are, those are sections when, when there's not a clear organization or individual uh, or group of individuals who kind of uh, take responsibility, take ownership of a, of, of a block, of a community. Uh, those are the neighborhoods that are vulnerable to violence. Those are the neighborhoods that are vulnerable to falling apart. The next war on violence, uh, at the end of the book you say, uh, the next war on violence or the war on violence begins with investment. And this is something you've made the case for, in fact, in your last book, Stuck in Place, durable, sustained investment. What kind of investment are you talking about? Is it private sector, or is it government, is it nonprofit? What is it? Well, it's gotta be all of those. All uh, of I started writing the book, as I said, in 2014, and, and it, you know, the last few chapters envisioned a new urban agenda focused on urban equality starting at the federal level, and, and then uh, November 2016 happened, and I had to rewrite the end of the book. Um, this, the, the idea of developing a new urban agenda that is driven uh, by the federal government is uh, so far from reality right now that I felt it was irresponsible to make another call for uh, you know, a, a durable urban policy agenda that, that starts with the federal government. Um, and so I rewrote those last few chapters of the book focusing on uh, the local investment. Um, and and you know, one of the cases I make is that uh, it's actually easy to make an argument for a mobilization against violence at a local level because there are no constituencies who are against that. You know, it, it, um, it is one of those issues that most people agree on. We have different explanations for violence, but um, almost everyone agrees that it's a crucial social problem. Uh, so I, yeah, I make the case that if, if um, city government uh, actors within the criminal justice system, the police department, and then local organizations and residents, if they are, are working together and if they have a sustained commitment uh, from the state, 
from the city, uh, from local foundations, from, uh, from philanthropists, uh, then that's the kind of investment that can transform uh, entire cities. And, and we have very strong evidence that that can happen. Uh, the challenge is making a sustained, a dur what I call a durable uh, commitment to cities. And, and that, even in Milwaukee, I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, I read the, the Blueprint for Peace and was inspired uh, by that. I think it is it's some of the most exciting ideas that I've seen. Um, I think the biggest challenge is making that commitment that is evident in that document, uh, making that sustainable, making that durable. Uh, it's going to take a huge amount of commitment and time, uh, but it's also going to take a huge amount of resources to, to bring that blueprint uh, into reality, and I think that's the biggest challenge. About 50 years ago, uh, only about 50 years ago, almost to the day, maybe a, a week past the anniversary, uh, the Kerner Commission report came out. And this was a report put together after the riots uh, in the late 60s. And essentially, the Kerner Commission came to a couple of conclusions. One is that you had to deal with the issue of racial bias, racial justice, and you also had to deal with the issue of investment. Yeah. When you look at what transpired from the late 60s to the point we are today, uh, did we simply ignore those, the warnings of the Kerner Commission or the advice of the Kerner Commission? Yeah, so I go back in, in one of the chapters of the book, I, I go back and I talk about that moment, that historical moment, and I didn't live through it, so you know, um, you can correct me if you, if, if you live through it and I get pieces of it wrong, but um, there were these two ideas about how to deal with the rising problems uh, that were present in, in cities at that time, and one was that they were the result of inequality and injustice. And that, that is kind of reflected in the Kerner Commission, uh, crystallized in the Kerner Commission, um, at least as I read that document. You know, that model, that, that the problems of urban inequality are, are driven by, uh, urban poverty are driven by inequality and injustice is so clear in that document. And then there's a different model that um, emerged in that deck in the 1960s uh, that argued that the, the problems uh, that were becoming increasingly present in, in central cities uh, were the result of lawlessness and disorder. Uh, and, and over the decade, I think the first model, the inequality and injustice model, uh, really dominated policy discussions and, and political debates. Uh, toward the end of that decade, the other model, uh, the model that focused on lawlessness and disorder, um, really uh, started to win out. Um, and I think that was most clear in the election of Richard Nixon, but then it became implemented into practice over the subsequent years. So if you look at what happened there, I, I, I talk about you know, the, the idea that our approach, our national approach to dealing with problems of urban poverty became one characterized by what I call abandonment and punishment. So that be, those became the dominant solutions to dealing with the challenges that were uh, becoming increasingly prevalent in central cities, and I think that model of abandonment and punishment has, there have been changes over time, but that basic model has remained intact since. Um, and, and, you know, I think in recent years there's been increasing focus on injustice, uh, and, and that has taken place over the past several years. I think there's been less focus on investment the investment that's really required to stabilize neighborhoods across the country. Uh, so that's, that's where I end in the book, making an argument you know, that the old model of, of relying on punishment uh, has broken down and we now have sufficient evidence. It's not just that this is how I think the world should work, it's that we have sufficient evidence to suggest that we can confront uh, the challenges of, of urban poverty, and particularly the problem of violent crime uh, with a model that relies on investment. We'll, we'll take questions here. This will be my final question, and we'll take a few questions before we, we take a break at 9. Um, so you're a social scientist. You're, you're a data guy. Um, you're not a, a, a prognosticator of the future. But, but as we sit here in this room, there are a lot of people who are interested in reducing crime and improving our neighborhoods. Is there a prescription based on the research you've done that works for a city like Milwaukee where while we may have seen some reduction in crime, we have not seen the dramatic reductions that some other cities have seen? I don't think there's a single prescription. I, I do think the starting point is having the, the key actors, meaning the city government, 
representatives of the criminal justice system, uh, the police department, and local organizations working together. And I've seen that in Milwaukee. Um, I think that, you know, it, I, I'm certain that it has not always been a harmonious uh, 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 working relationship, but I've seen that. The fact that people come out to this type of event is a reflection of that. Um, the second piece is really uh, drilling down and making sure that there is a foundation, a stable foundation of organizations for every community. Um, I call them community quarterbacks in the book, but that, that there's some set of organizations that are uh, present in every single neighborhood across the country, I'm sorry, across the city, uh, that are making sure that that neighborhood doesn't fall apart, uh, that that neighborhood doesn't succumb uh, to a, a spike in violence and, and allow that to tear the, the community apart. Um, so if you have the set of working relationships in place and then you know the next piece is really generating the investment to make sure that there's some community quarterback in every, uh, looking out over every block across the city. And that's very abstract, but I think that's, that's a starting point for, for thinking about how to make sure that there's no neighborhood that falls apart. Let's take a few questions for Professor Sharkey. If you're in the seating bowl down here, just press on that, see that uh, little device right in front of you? It says push on it, keep your finger down, keep pushing, we'll be able to hear your question. If you're in the back, can you wait for Ryan Rao? He has a microphone in his hand. Uh, we prefer not to have speeches so we can get to as many questions as possible, but uh, we appreciate your input. So, yes sir, we'll begin with you, yes. Hi. Good morning, Professor Sharkey. Thank you for making another visit to the city. Uh, my name is Lee Valentine. I work with the Clark Square Neighborhood Initiative, um, one of the Zilber neighborhoods. Um, I'm about two thirds of the way through your book and I've been very intrigued by it. Uh, one of the questions that's been prevalent in my mind is uh, your use of the homicide rate um, as kind of the, the main indicator of violence. Did you, do you have any indicators that suggest that the homicide rate is uh, like the best proxy for other types of violent crime? Um, or I, you make allusions to some other types of violent crime. I'm just curious if the homicide rate is the, the best one or if there's other data that you used. And then uh, I'm curious about, um, you, you mentioned today types of homicides, and I'm wondering if um, homicides that are known to be between people who know one another um, kind of are less um, disturbing to people. You talked about the Beltway snipers, for example, and that type of those types of homicides are horrifying because they're so random. So if you could talk a little bit about the nuance of, of those homicides and if people are less affected when there's homicides between people who know one another. Thanks, thanks for the question. Uh, so the first question, yeah, the, hom the homicide rate is, is not the exclusive measure that we should rely on. I think it's the best measure because it's measured everywhere and it's measured well. Uh, and it's measured not just by police departments, but it's measured by health departments, and and um, you know, and so we know that it, uh, at least if you're interested in trends, that it's a that it's a good measure. Um, but one of the one of the you know points I make in the book is that we're not dependent. My conclusions aren't dependent on on that measure. So you know, a lot of people are skeptical of of measures of violence that arise from police departments or that are and reported to the FBI, like the, the national homicide rate. Um, and you know, one of the points I make is that if, if there are other measures like what's called the National Crime Victimization Survey, which is a, just a survey asking a, a national sample of Americans uh, whether they've been victimized or assaulted in the past six months. Um, and so you know, the, the numbers, from the official homicide rate suggests that violence has fallen by almost half uh, since the early 1990s by about 45%. The numbers from those victimization surveys suggest that violence has fallen by about 75%. Uh, so they actually show us a, a more substantial uh, decline. Um, the broader point being no matter what measure we use, they track well together. Uh, in terms of trends. So you may not know the exact number of homicides in a given year in a given city, um, but you can get a good sense of trends over time from that measure. Um, second question, I think I'm, I'm a little bit wary of, of classifying uh, incidents of violence to, and, and really focusing on one type like uh, homicides between strangers or homicides on the street. And the reason is because they, they all move together. Um, and so if you focus on 
purely on a particular type of, of, of violence. Um, you often miss you know, other forms of, of violence going on within homes, within buildings, uh, between family members. Um, and, and one of the general conclusions uh, that we know with, with pretty good confidence is that different forms of violence move together. So it's usually, uh, um, now there can be a particular focus on domestic violence, for instance, or there can be a particular focus on gang-related violence, and, and I would never argue against that, but I think it's, it's probably a mistake to try to distinguish too much between one type is falling and another type is not. Does that make sense? Other questions? Um, yes, sir. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Harvey Kurtz. I'm representing the Walkers Point Safety Network, which was a volunteer activity of the Walkers Point Association, a neighborhood nonprofit. So we're very interested in what you're saying, and something you said suggests you might be familiar with the NOLA project. And you said you referenced cameras throughout the cities, which is their purpose. Are, are you familiar with that in New Orleans? In New Orleans? Yeah. Is that what no. Oh. Not, not OK. Well, they have a, a deal with a camera company that pays, you know, allows them to buy cameras. And they have literally, at least the university professor who counseled us on this said, they've got cameras all over the city. And okay. it has dramatically reduced crime of all kinds. And I was going to ask you to classify that in terms of your analysis of old methods or new methods, because when we work with the police in, in District 2 in Walker's Point, they're very interested in cameras, and they want more cameras. They want us to map all the cameras. Is that old, or is that new, or is it, is it worth doing? Yeah. Um, it's a tricky question. I think half of the people in the room shudder when they think about it, and half are you know, nod their heads when, when they think about it. I'm, I'm, I kind of uh, fall somewhere in between. Um, I, you know, I think it's, so the expansion of video surveillance systems that I talked about, is, you know, it started really in the 1990s, I think was a part of kind of just the transformation of how public space changed. Uh, you can't walk into Central Park without being recorded, you know, and that's, that's a major change. I think we, we, there's actually not great evidence on its impact, but I think the evidence suggests, as you're saying, that, that it does reduce crime. Um, I also know that you know, as the technology gets better, it will probably be a much more useful uh, technology in the sense that in, in a, a lot of cities have, have had video surveillance systems installed for a while, um, but low quality uh, videos, and it's just, it's, with, in my experience, it's hard for them to actually do much with, with the video. Um, it will solve a crime every once in a while, but it's not really a deterrent uh, uh, to, to crime. Um, well, the technology has changed considerably, yeah. and I was really wondering whether you thought cameras everywhere would be a, another form of a new urban guardian. I, I would, A, I'd argue that we should test it more rigorously, and C, because so many people are uncomfortable with it. I personally would be an advocate for it, despite my discomfort, um, because I do think if it's shown to reduce violence, um, I think you know the more, I mean, it's better if it's people that are looking out over public space. Um, but I do think there are, you know, A, we can learn a lot from it. I watched a video in, in, on State Street in Milwaukee, and this was just me, like, uh, I, I forget why I, was, I found myself um, on this, uh, I think it was the Journal Sentinel published a, a video, but uh, um, uh, I'm not sure. Um, but there was, it was on State Street, and there was a shootout on State Street. And it, it might have been a high-profile event, maybe that's why I saw it. But, uh, and somebody pulled out a, an automatic rifle, semi-automatic rifle. And, and this is in the middle of the, uh, of the street. And you know, for me, you shouldn't, that person should not be willing to do that. That person who did that should know that he is, is going away for a long time if he does that. Uh, and so if a, a video surveillance system makes that person less likely to do that, then I, th I would vote for it. Let's take other questions. Deb, I'll go down here, and then we'll go back there. Just keep, it says push on it, uh, the green. Huh. There you go. Um, I'm focused on the community guard, guardian concept. And I'm wondering if you have any evidence with regard to um, 
the size of a community, I'm talking about blocks, not body count or resident uh, number, where a community garden effort, guardian effort can be effective. I mean, I'm assuming if you get too large, it's too much to, to manage. So if you have any uh, data or sense of size. Yeah, it's a challenging question. I think the more general question of how we build stronger neighborhoods, then you want to look at a, at a larger community and see the set of institutions that are, kind of form the foundation of that neighborhood. But then when you get to the more specific question about violence, you know, one of the things we know about violence that is, it, it's just not, it's not just that it's a committed, a, a very small number of people commit a disproportionate share of it, it's that a, a very small number of places account for a, a disproportionate share of, of violence. And even more than that, actually, it's, it's a very small number of hours uh, account for a disproportionate share of violence. Um, and so there, I think the issue of size of a community matters because you really want to, when, when you're particularly focusing on violent crime, the more precise you can get in terms of the specific spots uh, where the police and the community can come together and figure out what's going on, what are the conditions on that block, at that corner, uh, at what times. You know, there I think you want to be as precise as possible. Um, but when you're, when you're developing a plan for the transformation of a community and really uh, developing a plan to try to create stronger neighborhoods, then I think the level of analysis can be broader. Then it can be, you can look at the set of institutions around a community. Let me take perhaps one more question and then we'll take a break. Um, Right. Uh, we'll try and get to him real fast. No, Joe, go ahead. I appreciate, appreciate your uh, strong emphasis on uh, community organizations and groups taking hold and having ownership of the community. Uh, no, no doubt about it. That that's a much better approach than. Uh, you know, catch the guy who's doing wrong, lock him up, and just, uh, you're not building anything positive. So I, I like that. Uh, when you talk about investment, uh, would you agree that investment in quality uh, drug treatment and quality mental health treatment would be extremely important because those factors are what drive, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 percent of the violence. Uh, and we just need to have more. Is that the kind of investment that you would agree is really important? Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and I think um, certainly mental health is a huge part of or one of the many challenges that are that are more prevalent in uh, in particular communities and that have a bigger or, or more direct relationship with violence. Um, I actually think alcohol uh, is, is another huge factor and you know it's alcohol use but also the uh, alcohol establishments um, uh, and that has a direct link to violence um, so I, I you know treatment for addiction is, is another factor the, the you know when we did this analysis of, of local organizations and their impact we our starting point was to try to figure out which organizations would likely have some impact on violence. So which are the organizations that are devoted specifically to crime, but also that are devoted to the factors that have a direct effect on, on crime. And I think all, at least our conclusions were that organizations that dealt with mental health, uh, addiction, uh, reentry, prisoner reentry, um, business improvement districts, um, these all actually had a, a relatively similar impact on violence from what we can tell. Um, now, there are, you know, these organizations have, uh, operate with varying quality, so there's not a single, you know, it's not really the program, it's who's running it and, and how effective and how committed and how uh, well resourced they are. Um, but I would definitely agree that the, the issues that you raise, particularly the mental health one, is a crucial one that has just been, um, completely neglected in cities across the country and, and in a lot of cases left to the police. I'm going to have to come back to, to folks later. I really apologize, but we're going to try and keep things on time today. Uh, before we take a break, and Professor Sharkey will be here throughout the morning, so if you want to buttonhole him and, uh, and uh, 
and talk to him about some of your ideas or your thoughts, that's fine. Um, when we come back, we will uh, continue our conversation. We'll talk with some uh, uh, community uh, organizations that are doing good, positive things and, and what's working for them and some of the challenges they face. And, um, and then we'll take another break after that and we'll be back focusing on investment and how investment improves neighborhoods and reduces crime. So uh, stay with us. We'll be back at 9.15. We'll start promptly at 9.15. Thanks again to Professor Patrick Sharkey. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks John. So um, two things. Uh, first of all, I did want to mention that if you're interested in Patrick Sharkey's book, Uneasy Peace, there are signed copies of it available out in the lobby. So if you want to check that out in between the sessions, that, that's great. Uh, it, it's a really, uh, it's a very interesting book on a lot of levels, and so I highly recommend it. Uh, we are now going to get into our first panel discussion for the day, and we've called this How Community Organizations Can Help Reduce Crime and Improve Neighborhoods. I'm going to introduce the panelists in alphabetical order. This seems only fair. So I'm going to begin with uh, Dr. Michelle Bria. Since 1996, uh, Michelle Bria has served as the Chief Executive Officer of Journey House, a community-based organization on Milwaukee's near south side that empowers families to move out of poverty by offering adult education, workforce readiness, youth development, and family engagement programs. Journey House annually serves more than 6,000 children and families at six locations. Dr. Brea received her uh, doctoral degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. She received her Bachelor's of Arts and Master's of Arts from Marquette University. Dr. Brea, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks very Go much. On you. Andre Lee Ellis, the gentleman next to me, is an actor, playwright, and activist. Many of you who've lived in Milwaukee for a while have probably seen Andre Lee Ellis perform. He is also a founder of We Got This. We Got This is a program based at Ninth and Ring on the city's north side that began with a, a group of young men, young boys, cleaning up their neighborhood and learning about gardening. And his program has now developed into an effort that Andre Lee Ellis calls putting the neighbor back in the hood. <laughs> Ellis is a Milwaukee native. He puts his energy into recreating neighborhoods, offering young people positive role models, a big important thing, and engaging with them in skills development. Andre Lee Ellis, thanks very much for being with us. Sister Patricia Rogers is the executive director of the Dominican Center for Women. That is in the Amani neighborhood, uh, 27th to 20th, Keith to North, roughly in that area, uh, which has seen a drastic reduction in crime over the last few years. A uh, native of Arkansas, Sister Patricia graduated from college with a major in math education. She has a master's in both education and social work. She is quoted as saying, the only way to change an impoverished neighborhood is to work with the whole family helping them gain an education, a voice, and finally the confidence to work together for the changes they decide will improve the community, that they decide will improve the community. Mm -hmm. And finally, Katie Sanders. Sister Patricia, thanks for being here. You. <laughs> Katie Sanders is the executive director of Safe and Sound. This is a uh, community liaison with law enforcement that's active in about 10 uh, neighborhoods right now, Katie. Uh, a Milwaukee native, uh, Katie uh, Sanders grew up in Sherman Park. She attended Milwaukee Lutheran High School and then UW-Madison. Her background is in public policy analysis. She became active as a resident block club leader in her own West Side neighborhood, and that has given her inspiration for her work. So Katie, thanks for being with us today. So uh, I'm going to begin with, with Katie Sanders, because what we want to accomplish in this session because of the people in the room who've been good enough to, to give us their time today. We want to talk about what works, what's worked for each of these organizations. And we also want to talk about the challenges they face. What could we be doing better? How do we do it better? So Katie Sanders, I'm going to begin with you. And, and tell us about Safe and Sound. Based on what you've done in these 10 neighborhoods in terms of trying to reduce crime and trying to improve community, uh, what has worked? from your perspective. Yeah, so thanks first of all for having ben. us here today. And I know many of our partners are in the room and are very familiar with what Safe and Sound does, but for those of you who are not familiar, Safe and Sound is a Milwaukee nonprofit that focuses on um, improving community police relations and public safety in five of the seven Milwaukee police districts. So we have a presence in Central City, Milwaukee, and within those five police districts, we have 10 priority neighborhoods. Um, our mission is to unite residents, particularly youth, 
law enforcement and community resources like so many of our partners here today to build safe and empowered neighborhoods. And although the organization is 20 years old, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this year, um, we restructured in 2015. And so the model that I talk about today is really specific to what we've been doing since 2015. Um, in each of our police districts, we have a staff of three particular team members. One works out of the district station. They're a community prosecution unit coordinator or a CPU coordinator. And that person really bridges the um, communication between community members and um, the various law enforcement agencies, including MPD, the district attorney's office, the city attorney's office, neighborhood services. Um, we also have a representative from Sojourner Family Peace Center on that team who works on the domestic violence cases. So it's a really centralized unit to work on place-based problem solving. And um, Professor Sharkey mentioned before, it's a small group of actors in a small group of places. And the CPU is really focused on um, that type of problem solving. We also have a staff member that goes door to door and works with adult residents and tries to build their capacity to work with each other. So when we talk about getting residents involved in their neighborhood and these urban guardians, that's exactly what we're working on, um, on building capacity for in the, the 10 priority neighborhoods. And then we also have staff that work specifically with young people. We know that young people um, are the most likely victims of crime and so really finding opportunities for them and that could be through safe and sound programming or programming of so many of our partners who are here today. So that's what we do and what works. Um, I know I'm mm -hmm. going too long here, I'll be Hello. brief. Um, when we restructured in 2015, we set it up based on academic research and quickly sought out to seek, sought out to evaluate that work. So when we redid our mission statement, we focused on our target, our goalpost is building collective efficacy in the neighborhoods. So we don't say that our goal is to reduce violent crime. We say our goal is to improve collective efficacy in our neighborhoods. And so we do measure collective efficacy throughout the year. We do 2,000 surveys of residents annually. And in the first two years of our restructure, um, an independent assessment by the Medical College found that we were effective in improving collective efficacy in six of the eight neighborhoods we were serving. And the, the intervention that was most statistically significant was block clubs. And it makes sense, right? This is all common sense. If you have active residents meeting regularly on um, issues that are important to them, you're gonna see a more tight-knit neighborhood, a closer relationship, and more activity amongst those residents. We also found that, um, I'm gonna keep laughing at me, but we also found, so this is important as we're talking about reducing crime, um, simply the sheer number of meetings and events that a neighborhood is holding influence the crime rates. And so um, it's this regularity of interaction between residents that is here in Milwaukee in 2016, 2015 and 2016 showing reductions in crime rates. One of the neighborhoods, Sister Patricia, that, mm -hmm. that Safe and Sound is active in, mm -hmm. is Amani. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where the Dominican Center is. Correct. What have you seen uh, that's been most effective in, in building this, this notion of a neighborhood that works together, that there's some social mm -hmm. cohesion, for lack of a better way of putting it? Mm -hmm. what, what's worked mm -hmm. from your perspective? Uh, the biggest thing that works is building relationships. And that's what the Dominican Center started out doing, was building relationships with the residents. And then out of that came trust. And once you have folks trust and you've built that relationship, then you can start to ask them to do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do or didn't think they could do. So this is really uh, what has worked for us. After building the relationships, then you have to challenge people to move out of their comfort zone to uh, talk to the elected officials, to go to those meetings, and to demand what they want. And once they can see one or two small wins, then you've got them. Then they know that they can do it. And it's not so much the Dominican Center doing it for them, but as long as they have their own voice and they are making their own decisions, then you can see change starting to happen in the community. But the biggest thing is building the relationships. And that takes time, does it not? It takes a lot of time. And it, it's not just building a relationship with, with the Dominican Center. It's building the relationships with each other. Uh, when we first started, when I first came to the Dominican Center, the area really didn't know that it was the residents in the area had no idea that they were in the Imani community. And so we had to start with them building relationships with each other, seeing themselves as a community, 
And it started just as small as having walks through the neighborhood saying what the name of the neighborhood was, that we are Amani, and Amani means peace. And getting uh, the residents also to embrace that they were in a community together. They weren't just living on separate blocks, but they really were a community. And so building those relationships, I just can't say enough about it because that's what's key. Andre Lee Ellis, you, you've built a community of sorts at Ninth and Ring, where you moved a few years ago. I heard you say you used to live in Brewers Hill, you moved to Ninth and Ring. Uh, tell us about uh, We Got This. This is an interesting idea and shows that one person, one person, can make a difference in a lot of lives. Okay, well, on the block where I live, I am the change that needs to be. On the block where I live, I'm helping to make the changes that the people need to see. On the block where I live, we got this incorporated begin in June 2014. And when I tell you I had no idea that this would be a part of my life, I had no idea. My wife and I had some financial struggles and we had to move to Ninth and Ring. At that time, Ninth and Ring was known as one of the second highest crime blocks in the city every day there was some kind of activity on the corner, whether it was drugs or shooting or anything like that, fighting, things like that. Well, the first week that we were there, maybe the third day that we lived there, I went outside to the corner store. And when I came inside, gunfire rang right out. And I thought, well, is this the welcoming committee or what? But um, it, it, it felt as if I got shot. That's how close and how vivid it was. And you're talking to a person who's never held a gun or shot one and has only had two fights in his life because I've able, been able to talk myself out of, <laughs> out of fighting. You know what I mean? Because I can't. I'm not a real good fighter, but I'm a great talker. <laughs> <laughs> so I stayed safe that way. But um, that, that, that week I decided that, that I couldn't live that way. And I watched a young man lay dying in the streets that day and it took about five to six, seven hours. And I watched the family run through the yellow tape. And I said, we got to do something. And right next to me was a vacant lot that had what somebody explained to me were two raised beds and some compost bins. And they were tattered. Nobody had done any bunch of weeds. And so I was talking to the cameraman from Channel 4, who happened to be <laughs> and, I'm familiar with them, yes. Uh, Andrew Triplett. <laughs> Andrew Triplett was his name, and he says, is that Andre Lee Ellis? And I said, yes. And I said, I live here now. And he said, wow. You know, he said, you're going to deal with this a lot. And I said to him, we have to figure out a way to take our hand off of the trigger and put it back into the soil. If this is supposed to be a garden, that's going to become the work that I do. So I got busy finding out who owned the garden. Long story short, we got a grant from the city of Milwaukee that I wrote. Um, and, and, and Eve's lap here, if I can say his name down there at the city, who's doing a great job Keep him in that position. Um, um, they, they granted us the money, and we went right to Will Allen at Growing Power and gave him every bit of that money to help set up the garden. And I said, we're going to start meeting in the garden. So we, I would get out in the morning and sweep the streets by myself, and I would talk to the drug dealers, and I would say, you know, I would make up little stories. I am a Christian but I, I do have to ask for forgiveness every day. But I would sweep the streets and I would say to the activity, hey, you guys should find somewhere else to go. I was at the uh, community meeting with the police station the other day. What's your name? And then they'll say, like, I'm Marvin. Oh, yeah, they did say your name. You was on the list. They're, they're watching you. And, and then I got with the neighbors, and I said, we need to put speed humps up here. And we put speed humps in the neighborhood, and the traffic energy stopped, and the noise reduction left. But then one, one Saturday morning, a mother frantically knocked on my door. And I'm almost shorter than you, Katie. I'm, 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 I'm almost done. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. a, 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 a mother knocked on my door frantically screaming because her 11-year-old boy was going to be arrested by the police. And she said, Mr. Andre, Mr. Andre, you got to come out and help. And I said, well, where is his dad? And she, and, I, and she said, we don't know where his father is, but he needs help. His name was Jermaine. And out of my mouth, I tell you the truth, out of my mouth, out of frustration, I said, oh, we got this. I'm on my way. We got this. Don't worry about it. We got this. And I came downstairs. We went over to the 5th District, spoke with the liaison police officer, and I explained to him, and I told a good Christian little lie. I said, <laughs> I said, you cannot arrest Jermaine because this Saturday I'm starting a program in the garden where I'm going to be teaching little black boys how to grow their own food, and Jermaine is my first person that's supposed to sign <laughs> up. I'm going to pay $5 
dollars an hour and I'm going to teach him how to grow food and we're going to clean up the neighborhood. Well, by George, he went for it and he said, I got to go talk to the captain and I'm excited about it, Andre. What's the name of your program? And I said, we got this. <laughs> I did. I said, it's, we got this. That's honestly how it started. We worked. I worked with Jermaine that Saturday. This 12-year-old boy worked so hard, and at some point he stopped and looked at me. He said, Mr. Andre, um, I'm nothing like, like what they say I am. I said, what do you mean, Jermaine? He said, the same people that tell me what not to do do worse things than me. He said, until today, nobody ever asked me what I wanted to do. Well, Jermaine made that $20. Later on that day, I saw him walking down the street. He had on a white pair of jeans. And I mean, they were clean white with a white t-shirt. His hair was cut, and his face was shining. I almost didn't recognize him. I was Jermaine, it's shining like new money, so I knew he had washed it because he had good good Vaseline or oil or something <laughs> on it. And I said, Jermaine, where you going? And then this young black boy did economic development in a way that I'd never heard of. He said, Mr. Andre, I made $20. I get to go skating. I'm going to take $5 and I'm going to ride the bus out there. I'm going to take the other $5 and then I got to pay my way in and I get to rent my skates. He said, and then I took $5 and I got a haircut and he brushed aside his hair. I've got a haircut. And then he said, and then with the other five, I get to get a hot dog and a soda. Jermaine haven't been in any trouble really since. I mean, he, he's a little bad, a little something sometimes, but as far as police contact, we haven't had that with Jermaine. But we worked with Jermaine. The next week, he came back with five more boys and told them that he knew where they could go work and get $20 so they all could go skating. I said, I don't know about that, but here's what we could do. I've got 5,000 friends on Facebook. We'll take a picture, put your fist in the air, and I'm going to ask five black men to come by 12 o'clock and bring $20 to help pay eager little black boys that wanted to do something honest to make a living. And by 12 o'clock, seven men showed up and took care of those boys. The next week, 10 came. We were fine until the third week when we had 34 black boys working. And, 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 and by that time, they, we were working on Ring Street, and I'll never forget this. And I was bent over, too. And I guess this voice must have thought I was 15 from the back. You know what I mean? He couldn't see my face, but the voice said this. Hey, what are you guys cleaning up, bullets? And when I turned around, it was a Milwaukee police officer in, in, in a van that said that. We dealt with that, and thank God for Fifth District who worked with us on that, and that officer was made to apologize. He even became a good supporter of the guard and would stop by with the money, but what made him say it? I didn't care, but that he had a chance to see that good people lived over there and that they had a chance to see that when you speak properly to people, you can get the right apology. It was how we handled it, but the program has grown and grown and grown. We've got national attention, but it's not the hoopla or the Hallelujah, because there's so much work to be done. They're still fighting. They're still dying. Things are growing. But the garden is the way to go, and I hope I get to talk more about that later. Absolutely. So much to tell you. <laughs> hey, Dr. Bria, you, you've been at Journey House for 22 years now. Yes. You, you said you have seen transformation, and this is, this is an area just south of Mitchell Park is a good way to describe mm -hmm. it for people in the audience. What kind of transformation and why did that transformation take place? Well, you see so many of our phenomenal partners that are sitting here that indulge me when I call them like, we need you. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do, but uh, we need you. And I think, uh, you know, 22 years Journey House and the Clarksville neighborhood was so much different. And uh, I want to dovetail on one of the models that Professor Sharkey investment. And I think uh, bl the blessing of the Zilber Family Foundation to believe and have faith when maybe other people didn't have the faith. And others, uh, we, we have a tremendous board of directors. We have amazing neighbors and participants. We all came together because we knew something better could exist. And we, we moved from um, the philosophy, and Professor Sharkey said, holding a neighborhood together, trying not to break. We moved from, this is an amazing, amazing neighborhood, and we build on our assets. 
So if we see an opportunity, because we don't like to say challenge, but there's an opportunity to make things better. And I see Ms. Tina Rule back there, the president of our Clarksbury Neighborhood Initiative. And we go to our go-to go to residents and leaders and our youth got engaged um, and we bring everyone together at the table and say okay here here's this opportunity let's think out of the box and we've been able to create these really out of the box ideas and make it happen Such and as. so when uh, uh, when we were able journey house was scattered in four different buildings that weren't really made for what we were doing. An old theater where we were playing basketball and ceilings would fall. And a, a church that we turned into an adult learning center. And when you're trying to teach English as a second language and other uh, uh, young adults are trying to study math, it gets a little crazy, but it seemed normal at the time. And to have belief uh, from like the Zilber Family Foundation, the Burke Foundation, and many other angels that we can do something better for our residents, we built the Journey House Center, which was a 34,000 square foot building, which I think is just opening yesterday, but it, we're actually in our sixth year. That transformation, along with all these other little wins that happened along the way, but that center has produced unbelievable, amazing things, things that we never anticipated possible. Um, and every day I go in, and, and many of you have been in there for different meetings, and there's just a synergy, it's a convening place. Uh, captain Morales, when he was captain of the second district, he would hold some of his, uh, you never know who you're gonna see, see there. Um, and then with that $6 million investment, that year, as soon as we opened the doors, we had another $2 million investment with a partnership with the Green Bay Packers. And I'll still coach Brown's story, just a real quick story. The, the day we finished our, we had over 800 residents involved in a, uh, thanks to the Zilber Family Foundation, our Clarksware Neighborhood Initiative. And we had just finished the, the planning meeting at the Milwaukee Christian Center, the former Milwaukee Christian Center. And as we, we were walking out, part of it was to build a football field. And we had a football program. Many of our residents wanted safe spaces for our, our kids to play. And we were just thinking, having a field that was lined with some two goal poles. Well, the Green Bay Packers happened to call Charles right when we were walking out the door and said, hey, we have a field for you. It's the former Ray Mischke practice field that's up here in Lambeau. Do you want it? He said yes. We didn't know how we, how, where we had the money to do this or where we were going to put it. But then the first person we ran into was Sue Black, the then director of County Parks. She's like, I'll put it on my head if I have to. And she's like, for better yet, let's go to Mitchell Park. And so we took our field and installed it. So now we have a two, another $2 million asset in a, a park, and especially the area of the park, the domes are so beautiful, but that area of park people weren't going into because really, really awful bad things were going on, and we made it beautiful. And now uh, people are running their, um, moms are walking their babies in strollers, there's people walking dogs, it just activated that whole park. And uh, prior to that, we were part of this weed and seed initiative because Clark Square had a really high rate of homicide at that time. When the, the center and then the field, we had no homicide or death that was gun related for a two and a half year period. So that's what Professor Shark yeah. talked about, you're transforming it, 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 public spaces. And it was the result of many, many different partners, the people who were homeless and living in the park, now we call park residents, and there are guardians I shouldn't say this, but there's no security system at that football field, but our park residents are the best guardians and stewards. And when you have a young person and, um, and people who live in the neighborhood come up and they just cry when they see, oh, the Green Bay Packers is here in our neighborhood, in our city. So that's just a few examples of what we've done. You, you mentioned uh, urban guardians, and mm -hmm. I, I want to ask Sister Patricia to weigh in on this because to reduce crime to improve neighborhoods, we have to ask a lot of the people who live there. It's not easy work. Mm -hmm. How challenging is it for the people who take that big important step forward mm -hmm. and say, I'm gonna make a difference in my, in my community? How difficult is that? Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, in fact, when people decide that they really are gonna take that step, 
they're depending on people listening to them and really taking them seriously. So when we have community meetings and we have the police department there and they say what's going on in their neighborhood and then they get back as a response, well, that's just your opinion. When they could say to them, to the police, this is where they're hiding their drugs. This is when they're out and active. This is where they are. And still, you're being turned off as if uh, you're just making it up or it's just something that you're imagining or saying. That's discouraging. It's, it's difficult when we have a relationship with the police and we have something like the BBC documentary come out that's labeled Dark Cities, Murders in Milwaukee that depicts the neighborhood where we are. Although we have this supposedly relationship, they never come and talk to us or any of the other organizations in the neighborhood who are really doing good work. But everything that's depicted is that everybody in the neighborhood has a gun and should be seen as dangerous. This is when uh, residents really get discouraged and wonder, why is this happening? And, and then to get people to even come and say, well, we didn't agree with this uh, documentary and it didn't turn out like we wanted it to. Uh, and, and even, we're sorry how it happened. That never happened in our neighborhood. Never happened. So when things like that go on, and uh, when I first came to the Dominican Center, the residents uh, would not call uh, to the department for complaints because what they had happening was that when they would call a complaint in, especially if something was going on in the community, uh, in their neighborhood next door, and the police would come, and they would come to their door and interview them. And then everybody in the neighborhood would know who called. Um, so, you know, just trying to build those relationships so that uh, people would have the, um, I guess the nerve to even report their own, the, the crime going on in their neighborhood. Once we really established with the police that if they had to come to the door, that they would go to two other doors in the neighborhood and talk to those folks. Uh, now people are not asking the Dominican Center to make those calls. The people in the, res in the neighborhood, the residents are making their own calls. They're not only making their own calls this last uh, Saturday meeting, they all put on their app, the, uh, the app where you can send in your complaints to the police department. So everybody has it on their app now because they want to be involved. But in order for them to stay connected, they have to see some results. And uh, so that's the piece. That's all. How do you follow up on that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would agree at 100%. And so I think we as an organization do a lot to teach residents how to interact with law enforcement. But this is absolutely a two-way street. And law enforcement needs to be willing to work with the community and respect the community members. And um, certainly we've come a long way, um, but we have a long way to go. And so, and I, I think some of the changes at the police department have been um, already encouraging and um, look forward to more. But uh, we have to, the book makes this point again and again, the community members are not going away, law enforcement is not going away, we have to find a way to work together, we have to find a way for those calls to go to where they need to go and be acted on, and then for that information to be communicated back to residents so that trust builds mm -hmm. and people don't feel like it's a waste of energy. And um, that is not an easy task. It's, it takes all of us and all, all of the community organizations being willing to spend time with law enforcement and with residents. But to Mr. Ellis's point earlier, we have to be willing to call out that behavior and the police department needs to be willing to work on it and resolve that behavior within the department. The, the work that you've done, um, you mentioned the initial encounter with police and sort of what, kind of wondering what's going on. 
How has it been since then? Well, you know, I have a little saying that I do with the young men because they see the police officers coming and dropping off checks or donations to help pay them for the work that they do. And I say, you can get to the point where the police don't bring you tickets anymore. They can bring you checks for helping you out with what you do. But I don't want to make it just a fun, happy thing because it's a lot of work. I spend a lot of time in the middle of the night running around the dollar night at the bar um, at 2.30 in the morning when they're out there shooting and fighting right in the middle of the street myself with their guns and things and asking them to stop and, and put it down. I also want to say that as long as the organizations and those of us that are working on the ground, grassroots level, have limited resources, you're going to continue to have the problems that you have because what happens is some groups are more connected or have a little more firing power in order to write the grants or are already 501c3. For us, the horse got before the cart. We had all kind of organizations coming and wanted to give, and I wasn't even sure if this is what I wanted to do. So for the first two years operating, we were just doing what we do. And um, we get as many as 100 boys in the garden on a Saturday. One Saturday, I had 100 young black boys between 12 and 16 years old, and I asked them, how many of you don't know your dad? 90 of them raised their hand. How many of you know your dad but don't have a relationship? Five more joined them. There were five out of that that knew their dad and possibly had a relationship if they were telling the truth. That's when I developed a saying, I may not be the birth dad, but I can be the earth dad. And that's what I am to them. And that's what's important is that it, it's us, those of us that are here with jobs and everything is a little nicer for us. You have no real idea on the ground what people are really going through and how bad they feel when you look at them as just, just somebody that's part of a grant or your organization coming, you hand out leaflets on the fence, I give the credit to the people. If it were not for them boys who get up on Saturday morning and they have to be there by 8 o'clock because 800.1 is late and I will not let them work. It has been five years and I've not let one person work and let me tell you that I get very few of them that are late. 6.30, 7 a.m. little black boys that are late for MPS are on time to work in the garden. Why? Because they will. And when they have somebody that love them more particularly a black man that look like something that's not in the house but that they can relate to. He's not a pedophile or anything like that, but coming to them really, really real, 100, I have to keep it that way because these kids will kill you by playing with them. And a lot of them have more access to guns than they do a dictionary. So I put my life on the line and, and Katie and different ones that have come, see how it is. You saw me in the ambulance this summer in the middle of an almost heart attack, asking everybody to come on Saturday and make sure these boys get paid. We were the number two highest crime block in the city for many, many years. We are now off the list, and it's because of the people. We had a fire last year, 11 family members in the fire. By the time the fire truck had got there, we had formed a lifeline, and we got all 11 people out. All they had to do was put out the fire. They were in blankets and everything. I didn't go in the house. I was the one that stood on top of my porch and prayed out loud. But, but the people are doing that, Mike. Michelle, Bria, I, I want to ask you about something that the Journey House is doing. And, and you, know, you talk about how you change neighborhoods. You're dealing with this issue of trauma. There's a lot of discussion right now about the impact of trauma, what our kids experience as young people. Uh, it's so sad. Uh, and, and yet they carry it with them through much of their life, if not their entire lives. Um, what are you doing to, because this is really part and parcel of building community, building safe neighborhoods. What are you doing to address the trauma issue? Absolutely. It's, it's probably the secret sauce when people come to Dream House, they're like, what's going on here? And it's uh, through what, what I appreciate and um, I want to also thank the Zilber Family Foundation for this is not only investment in the neighborhood, but investing in other partners to bring to the table. And one of the partners that came to the table eight years ago was the International Association for Human Values. And they have a program called YES, the Youth Empowerment Seminar. And I think every human being should do it. Um, and what it is, is we teach advanced breathing techniques to calm the mind. And it's coupled with core human values. So talking about uh, teaching points of responsibility, commitment, comfort zone, operating in your courage zone, being 100%. And uh, through this, um, we see that 
Childhood trauma can not only affect the current health situation of a young person, but when you have stress and cortisol production, it helps you, it, it distracts you from making good decisions. So there might be some young men uh, in Andrew's program, we got this, who might not make good decisions because the stress is so much and all this stuff. It's not that they want to make that decision, but their mind is not calm. So we can actually teach breathing techniques to help you decrease stress which actually increases a calmer mind, it lowers your blood pressure, it lowers your heart rate, and that you're able to make some good decisions. But then when you get beyond that, it's not just about decreasing stress, it's about increasing performance. And when you understand that anything is possible, anything is possible, then it is a whole paradigm shift. And what, you, what we're doing is building a culture of peace. I know that sounds hippy-dippy and all that stuff, but it's true. It is so true. And so it's so true that right now on our job descriptions, um, all our staff are teachers of the YES program. We have meditation throughout the different uh, parts of the day. We do it with all our, all our, all, anyone age nine and over to twilight, if you want to participate in an air football program, baseball program, GED, ELL, you go through the YES program, parents go through the YES program, and what it creates is, it really is this culture of peace. It shifts energy because um, kids now know how to deal with stress. They go home and their parents are like, what are you doing? You know, they come back and say, you know, I really was able to get along with mom tonight. It was the first time, or mom really said something that was pushing my button, so I took a walk instead of acting out. And then the parent comes in, what's going on? I want to be part of this. And so uh, through meditation, you can actually calm the mind. And so we've, we have been working on, on putting this infrastructure and infusing it, not only into Journey House and all our programs, but um, it has spread out into the neighborhood. There's, there's a shift. And when you believe anything is possible, when, that's when, when you see an abandoned house where all this, all this awful stuff is going on, and you call up your partners, like I, Ivan came up to the table, and you know, I call John Chisholm and the mayor and the Captain Morales, everyone comes to the table like, kind of like Andrew, like we got this? Like, what, what can we do to make this happen? And actually, then it starts changing systems at the local government, like at the city and the county, because um, bureaucrats are like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. But uh, you have upper leadership saying, let's, let's make this happen. And so now we're, we're, we're shifting things. But um, it, it really is part of wellness. And so with exercise and sleep and nutrition, having healthy relationships, meditation, and then what we're missing, which I hope we get soon, is that mental health component to add that um, professional mental health provider. I want to uh, spend the rest of our time, we'll take some questions again. I'll ask each of you, because you, your organizations and the work you've done has, um, have or has met with success, and, and yet there are still challenges or opportunities, as mm -hmm. Dr. Bria would say. There's still challenges out there. Um, Katie Sanders, I'm going to begin with you. What could make you more successful? What do you need at this moment to do even more in the community? Sure. I think, um, you know, I, this is usually the answer from any nonprofit, right? Sustained investment. Um, but one of the things that we've seen as an organization is four years ago, we were over 90% federally funded. And we've worked very hard to change the revenue pie for the organization. Now we're 60% federally funded through, a diff through three different sources and 40% privately funded. So thank you to the corporations and foundations and individuals who have really stepped up and seen public safety as a priority. Um, that has basically been replacement funding for us. So we're the same size, a little bit bigger, about 10% bigger. Um, but we're doing the same, we're, we're not expanding in a way that I think we need to be in order to address some of the um, issues in the community. We're in 10 priority neighborhoods. Um, there is a situation with displacement, so we know the work that we do can sometimes move crime into other neighborhoods. So for us, it's about being able to be more 
doing more in more neighborhoods. But then we're also facing threats as it relates to investment. So I mentioned the Community Prosecution Unit, um, the District Attorney's Office, and I see John here, has lost funding um, for some of the community prosecutors. And so what this means is that the prosecutors who were in districts getting to know residents and community groups and organizations and understanding the problems that are happening in those places, for, in, in a real personal fashion, are now moved back downtown and are making decisions on cases based on paper files. So this is, this is taking us a step back if we don't find funding for those prosecutors and we should be putting more money into community prosecution and seeing these place-based problems solved where they're happening in real time rather than trying to fight funding um, um, losses. So, you know, the, it's, it's about being able to see what works. For me, it's about seeing what works and doubling down and investing in those strategies and not trying to do too many different things all at once, but say, here's what the data shows. We know this is, this is impactful. It's making a difference. Let's invest for the long term. Andre Lee Ellis, when I listen to, to the work you're doing, you know, the obvious question I have is, how do you sustain that long term? Because you need to, to pay these kids for their work. You need a stream of, of money. How, how do you do that? What, what would help you in, in the future? Well, we've got a couple of things happening now. We've grown a whole lot. We, are now, we now have a board of directors, and we're going for our 501c3 have its own. We have the judicial agent was Andre Lee Ellis and company, but the garden project is, uh, we got this as something I really, really want to do now. I'm committed to it. I'm, more than I think of being on stage, I have my hands in the soil and growing food. So now we own the lot where the garden is. We got it for a dollar from the city. We even purchase a lot across the street from us for a dollar that's going to become a fruit orchard. We also just were rewarded five people that can work part-time, I mean work full-time for us at minimum wage through Transform Milwaukee so they'll be able to help us and we have more hands-on through the Office of Violence Prevention and thank you Reggie Moore, I see him in the back back there, get to say it publicly. We're going to be incorporating hoop houses this spring into what we're doing on the grounds. We're getting some gates we give it at hours. We're going to also be inviting other organizations and groups to come into the garden and bring their young people and have a meal and learn what gardening and planting is right over there. And we're going to be doing more hands-on things with the neighbors. So what will bring us more? We're not looking for the government funding because that changes so much what the program is. We'll take it for other things. But we need you to visit www.wegotthismke.com and make a donation of your choice because when you do it, we have it, and as I always say, it's we got this because we is me upside down any way you look at it. We need, we need the people to keep proving because we like it grassroots, but with the board of directors, we got some dynamic people that are going to help us stretch out and get some funding for the other programs because the 500 Black Tuxedo event is working. We got young men that are now choosing agriculture as a field of work, and so through the United States Department of Agriculture, they can go to college for free free when they maintain certain grade point average for three years. So there's a whole lot. You want to know more? I bought a few cards with me and I'd be willing to sit and talk. <laughs> Michelle Bria, uh, what, would, what would make the work you do better and bigger? Uh, I, I agree with Katie about durable, sustainable uh, investment and funding, and we've been very blessed to have, have that, but to increase it so we can, we can scale wellness. And in wellness, um, there, there's economics in, in, in that. And what we see is with the, the durable investment that we've had, uh, especially over the, the last nine years, that is attracting other investment. So we have the $6 million journey house, we have the $2 million Packer fields, we have a $20 million investment from Crystal Ray High School, a new Jesuit high school that will be right in the center of the neighborhood. Uh, we're, we got $8 million in WIDA tax credits, so now there will be the first new bill uh, uh, new build uh, housing for families and our youth aging out of foster care on either side of Clark Square Park. Uh, we have some more investment uh, that is coming forward for the Cesar Ch Chavez Drive that is going to uh, uh, explode that drive. And so what we see is when you can align investment and go deep, it's going to attract other investment that you can help help scale things. And with this wellness is also 
also. When, when you have healthy and well people and your mind is calm, with our workforce program, we, ha we have this mental toughness component, and it's very unique. And so we have 41 employer partners. We can't produce people fast enough, and that's a capacity issue because the, the people that are going through our program are some of their best employees. But then looking at that transportation issue, so not only helping the valley grow uh, with jobs, but the outlying areas and developing and increasing that capacity for transportation so that our, we can literally move someone out of extreme poverty within a, a uh, eight week period and they're earning over 34,000 salary, not counting over overtime and, um, and bonuses. So we had, we're in a true era where jobs, especially here in Milwaukee, I'm not sure the rest of the country, but the economy is booming and we can get everyone to work, but we have to take care of a few things. But investing in uh, strategic investments will help us create a, uh, a well community and a thriving community, both financially, spiritually, and health. Place. Sister Patricia, what would uh, allow you to continue to do the, the important work that, that is being done? What would, what would give you the chance to do even more of that work? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I echo the same thing. You know, if we had the right funding, sure. that would be great. But for me, it's more than that. Uh, I think for nonprofits, we have to start getting out of the way of the residents. The residents must lead the way. So that's my job, is to get out of the way. The, the, the money that I would need is to help with the back office support that we could give residents. Nothing is going to continue in the Amani neighborhood if I leave, and I leave with all of the connections and all of the funding, knowing who the funders are. If I do not turn that over to the residents, we're not going to succeed. Right. So the biggest thing is us supporting resident leadership. And that's what we're looking for. When I can have someone take over my job and I can retire, <laughs> that's when I'm successful. And when that's a resident and when I know that the people in leadership in the Dominican Center happen to be residents, that's when we will be successful, and that's when Amani will be successful. The, any of the programs that we start are not going to sustain themselves without the residents saying, this is what we want. So my job right now is finding out what is it the residents really want. I don't start programs. They have to start them, and then they have to be the ones to sustain them. So for Amani to really be successful, the residents have to lead the way. Let's take some questions. Again, if you're in the seating bowl, push down on the button that says push, ironically. And, uh, and if you're in the back, uh, we'll have Ryan come over with a microphone and he'll take your question just as soon as he reappears. There he is. <laughs> yes, sir. So I am. Um, currently the assistant chief of police in Milwaukee. 13 days. <laughs> I uh, can say it's uh, fairly disheartening to hear that there are members of the community that feel that they can't work with our police department. If that is the case, then we have failed as an agency. All I would ask is that there's a new administration in place. We are going to work very hard to improve police and community relations. I'm from 29th and Hampton. Chief Morales grew up on 33rd and Garfield. People and communities will no longer be just dots on the map. We recognize the things that are happening in these communities and we recognize who the community leaders are. So I would just ask that you all give us a chance to make a difference because we got this. <laughs> Where did Ryan go? Is it, there he <laughs> Can you hang on just a second? Because Ryan's got to walk the stairs, and he's already tired. He's got new new babies at home, so it's like, <laughs> you know. 
Now I feel guilty <laughs> for asking. Um, Marquette, as with most universities, do a lot of research in the communities in which you live, reside, and work. And one of the concerns I've had is how do people who are largely of privilege, as myself, go into a community to do research? What advice do you have to them? Because my concern always with my students at Future Milwaukee is that that, that issue of trust or in, in the notion of giving empowerment, that's not our job. So what advice would you give to faculty, staff, and in my case, my students, what advice would you give us about coming into the community in order to do research? Anybody want to tackle that? Yes. I will. We, we just dealt with that not long ago. And uh, the advice that I would give is come into the community meetings and talk with the residents about what you want to do and why. We had one university come in with the questionnaires already made out. And they learned right away that no one was going to answer those questions. So please come in, and because our communities have been studied to death mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and with no results. So I think if you can come in and talk to them and let them help build whatever the questionnaire or whatever it is, I think you'll be more successful and more welcome. You know, what I'd say to that is, and, and, and I, I often, as, as much as I like camera work and all of that, I often turn down people that come in and want to do studies and film and things and use our project. When the 53206 movie was being filmed, I turned it down. I didn't want that because it's not what it's all about. So make sure you're genuine when you come. If you just got the funding to get it and you just got to get some words in order to satisfy the funding, then we're not the ones that you want to do it with because I'm going to follow what you do and I'm going to follow up with you and then if it doesn't represent correctly, I'm going to ask you why not. So, so make sure your heart is really in what you're doing and, and make sure you're being honest about why you're there and what you want to do with the data that you, you, you can see because we're not the worst place in America to raise a black child because if we were, how did we got to start right there where you say it is? You should have asked us. You went and asked the wrong people. You didn't ask the urban people. You asked the suburban people. And I think you need to be genuine when you come in to do your studies. If you mean it, we don't mind sharing with you. Other questions? Let me uh, we'll go right here. Hi. Your stories are incredibly inspiring. Thank you so much for all the work you do. Um, you mentioned leadership planning for succession planning. My experience has been that's also incredibly crucial and hard to do. So what are you all doing? for succession planning, for leadership from your communities, and if nothing, or you know, what do you need? What would help? That's a great question. Succession planning, what are the various organizations, what are you doing to, to ensure the next generation of leaders? So um, I'll answer it in two ways. The entire work of Safe and Sound is about training residents to get involved and feel that their voice is important and heard. So. If we are successful and if we are doing the work that we are set out to do, we take ourselves out of that mix. So it's really about handing that transition over to the residents and making sure that they're leading. And we should be behind the scenes, which sometimes is detrimental to our um, story because you don't always see us at the front of the, the situation. But internally, I'm really proud because we've, we, you know, we hire um, the best and brightest organizers from the city of Milwaukee to work with residents and have created a, a staffing structure where there's leadership opportunity and we pay family sustaining wages with benefits so that we as a nonprofit are not perpetuating the poverty that we're trying to address as a nonprofit community, but rather um, really building up residents as staff members, but then also through their work, the residents that they touch. So for us, it's a really comprehensive strategy. Mm -hmm. Briefly, I, I mean, there's Andre Lee Ellis. What happens if you're not there? You know what? It's not, it's not going to happen because I've created 100 others of me. But I also, we have created the talented 10. We have 10 young men that we selected who were once 1.0 students that are now 3.0 students and are very interested in that neighborhood. And we've made them the junior. We're going to make them the junior board of directors so that they can 
do the work and learn how to do the work themselves. It is extremely important that they learn the whole model too on the block where they live. They can be the change that needs to happen. So wherever they go in the world, they can know how to go and behave, bring change and make it happen on the block. So we're teaching the young people how to not only grow food, but how to grow their life. Michelle Bria, you, you, we said you've been there 22 years. Mm -hmm. um, who is, who's next? I mean, you, clearly you must have discussions about succession. Yeah, and that's part of the sustained investment and growing capacity to bring staff up to fair market value and to, because um, many of us may do five different jobs at once, to diversify that so that if one of us isn't hit by a bus, everything is gonna, gonna move, move on. And that comes through um, uh, beyond funding leadership development. And you know, we read the entire staff and board and participants. We go through at least four to five books uh, a year on leadership development. Part of what we do with uh, the YES program is about developing, because um, when you have a calm mind and you're decreasing stress, then you can see more clearly different career pathways. So supporting individuals in whatever career pathway that they want. And then it's very time intensive too. So with some of our senior leadership, we meet for three hours from like seven to 10. You know, every Tuesday night, we have fellows who were young men who didn't think they lived beyond 19, and uh, they worked directly with myself and, and the deputy director and some other senior leaders. So we're training them in what it takes to run a, a nonprofit. And so really training, um, training, providing leadership opportunities where people can, can shine, um, uh, but it is time intensive and it takes a lot of strategic thinking to make that all happen. Sister Patricia. Mm -hmm. the, uh, when we had the Building Neighborhood Capacity Program, the uh, cross-sector partners started what was called the Neighborhood Leadership Institute. And this is where they took uh, a person from the organization and also from the, the residents to uh, programs for leadership training. And I have been looking at those coming out of that training as people to hire. And I've hired now three of those folks. And we continue, and I continue to look <laughs> at the neighborhood to see who are the leaders, because we have leaders there. Uh, right now, we just don't have enough money to pay them for them to want to come on. So uh, that's, so we're trying to get so that we can pay fair money so that some of those leaders in the neighborhood really be, will be the ones that will step forward. Um, I'm going to wrap things up here for, for this panel discussion. Uh, we will take another 15-minute break. We'll be back at 1030. We'll be talking about how sustained investments can make a difference in terms of building and improving neighborhoods and reducing crime. But for now, I want to thank our first group of panelists, Michelle Bria, Andre Lee Ellis, Sister Patricia Rogers, and Katie Sanders. Thank you very much. Uh, our second panel uh, focuses on the question of how sustained investments can help reduce crime, help build community, help improve neighborhoods. Uh, I will introduce the panelists again in alphabetical order, and we'll begin with Ivan Gamboa. Uh, Ivan Gamboa serves as Senior Vice President at Tri-City National Bank in Hales Corners. He was appointed Chair of the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority by Governor Walker in 2016. He has previously served as a board member on the City of Milwaukee Plan Commission, as a board member on the City of Milwaukee Equal Rights Commission, and as Economic Development Director for the Milwaukee Alliance. Won't you please welcome Ivan Gamboa. Susan Lloyd is the executive director of the Zilber Family Foundation, and she leads the Zilber Neighborhood Initiative, which is aimed at revitalizing the neighborhoods that have been hit hard by poverty, crime, foreclosures, joblessness, and low education attainment. Uh, Susan Lloyd has been quoted as calling it the best job in the world. Uh, she is an optimist, clearly, who believes, uh, despite challenges, that good work will win out. So Susan Lloyd, great to have you with us. Let me see here. We'll go back to the next one. Um, Keith Stanley, the gentleman seated next to me. Uh, Keith is the executive director of Near West Side Partners, which is a nonprofit formed by 
um, what we call anchor institutions, large employers in the near west side. So you have Marquette University, Harley Davidson, Aurora Healthcare, Potawatomi, uh, Miller Coors. Um, he also leads the Avenues West Association, a neighborhood improvement group. Uh, Keith Stanley grew up in the Sherman Park neighborhood. He graduated from Rufus King High School here in Milwaukee, and then he headed off to Alabama State, a historically black college. He is now back in Milwaukee, and uh, we are delighted to have him here today. Thanks very much. And Doncia Strong Hill is the executive director of LISC Milwaukee. Doncia has a strong background in policy, real estate, and community development. She has her law degree from John Marshall Law School and a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. Her previous public service included working as a policy analyst in the Clinton White House and as a senior advisor in the U.S. Department of Energy. Won't you please welcome Doncia Strong Hill. So in Patrick Sharkey's book, uh, Uneasy Peace, in, in the final chapter, he talks about the war on violence. And he says the war on violence begins with investment. So we want to spend the next hour talking about investment. And we have people who come at this differently. Ivan's working in the private sector. Susan's in the, the philanthropic arena. Uh, Keith Stanley uh, doing uh, nonprofit work, but with anchor institutions on the west side. Doncia Strong Hill coordinating a lot of these groups, trying to make uh, big ideas come to fruition. So they all come at this a little bit differently. And, and I want to begin there and, and get a sense of, of how they view the, the investment picture. Let's begin with the private sector. Ivan, I'm going to start with you. Um, right. What can the private sector do to build community? What is it doing in Milwaukee to build community? Well, I, to give everyone a little background of my perspective, I have uh, I've get to go about t back 12 years, 2005, 2006. I was just coming into the city, uh, came up from Illinois for a lovely woman who's now my wife, Gigi, and uh, settling into neighborhood development work, working for a nonprofit. The nonprofit was not sustainable. It closed its doors. The executive director um, went to the bank, said, we cannot pay our line of credit back. I'm very sorry, but Ivan Gambo is good. You guys should hire him. I <laughs> uh, subsequently uh, went and interviewed with uh, Tri-City National Bank, uh, Scott Wilson, the executive vice president, and he pitched to me this idea that I will teach you banking and you can still do your community development work and I feel that you'll do uh, more through Tri-City National Bank than any other opportunity you would have. And, and he was right. And so I've felt like I've been able to practice learning how to be a banker, working in community development, doing small projects and seeing if they work. And if something small works, then we can, we can expand it and we can, we can do more. So I think the private sector needs to figure out who's doing the work on the ground and help them and, and get it done. Um, and that's the, it's been trial and error, and that's what I've been doing for 12 years. You, you, I think, have said that you know not every deal needs to be a $20 million deal. You can make a big difference in a community with small <coughs> loans, smaller deals. I um, mean, one example was during the economic downturn, uh, the foreclosure crisis, uh, and... Uh, Layton Boulevard West Neighbors, who I had known from my nonprofit days, and now I'm wearing my banker hat, Layton Boulevard is like, hey, uh, we need your help. We have a lot of foreclosures in the neighborhood. We want to fix them up. And uh, we're like, okay, so how many houses have you uh, fixed up? Well, we're going to do this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so, but what we did at the bank is kind of figure out, all right, well, how does one of these look like? So they would buy the house. We actually, uh, Lisk was a, we brought in Lisk as a partner and they, are, they did the second mortgage. So we bought, the, four, the, we bought the, the price and we were the first mortgage. Then we brought Lisk in to fix up the house. Then they got federal grants to really make this a nice house that they could sell to a family. Well, it worked. And then they wanted to do more. And pretty soon they're like, hey, can we do two at a time? We're like, sure, we'll do two at a time. And they build, we build capacity together. We learned how they did it. They, they trusted in us. And pretty soon they were, so, they were doing so well that they didn't need Tri-City National Bank anymore. Now, luckily, they did, they did come back a couple <laughs> years later. And we gave them a line of credit so they can buy a bunch of houses in the neighborhood and put them together. But the side effect was that, uh, you know, the 
when you buy a house, then you have to get an appraisal, and then they check with all these other sales in the neighborhood to see what, what is your house worth. And if there's nothing to compare it to, right. your house is worth nothing. <laughs> and so what this did is Layton Boulevard West Neighbors actually uh, created a market for good quality homes, energy efficient homes, and the demand was there. There was families that wanted this, uh, wanted to be part of the neighborhood, and it, 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 it's a big success, and they're, and they're still doing it to this day. Uh, Don says strong, he made an interesting comment. A couple of, we were talking about investment, but he also used the word capacity. And, and investment, I think you've referred to it as, as muscle building. I mean, right. yeah, what do you mean by that? What, what, how is it muscle building? <clears throat> so if, if a community or a neighborhood, an organization, uh, residents in a community have not had the experience of working through some of those issues um, or the experiences of bringing something forward uh, to fruition, um, they don't know how to do it. And so there is a need to train, but you don't learn the first time. So it's like riding a bike, it's like running, you build muscle over time by continuing to do that. And we have to be prepared to allow um, communities and organizations to muddle through and learn and work diligently forward so that they're building muscle and uh, gaining the experience um, so that they are developing and building and, and winding up with something that looks um, like what they think they want. It's not always going to be what they planned it, but what they think they want. Sometimes that, that works. Um, I have a uh, I, idea and a thought about um, capacity building in a, along the line of what Ivan talked about, and it is block integrity. So <laughs> Ivan could fund two houses on a block, but if the rest of the block looks like a jack-o'-lantern with uh, vacant lots or something that is less than um, market rate or a house that anybody would want to live in, it's going to be very difficult to build the market there. And so um, something that we have to think about doing in terms of building capacity is the capacity to work together to bring all the resources that we can and align them and build out the entire block so that those who need just a touch of uh, a porch get that, those who need a roof get that, those who need a full scale bring it down to the studs, um, get that kind of treatment, and that there's infill development, and that is when you build block integrity, and we need to build the muscle to build block integrity in the neighborhoods. Susan Lloyd, let me uh, ask you about the, the work of the Zilberg Family Foundation. So you focused on a, a number of neighborhoods in this city for how many years now? Well, we're in our 10th year of the Zilber Neighborhood Initiative. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's somebody who is generous, like Joe Zilber, said, you know, I want to make a difference in, in my hometown. Um, how do you make the decisions that, that are so important to the success of this initiative? How do you decide how you work through organizations that are on the ground? How, explain to us how it works and why it works. You know, I'm very fortunate because Joe Zilber was still alive at the beginning of the Zilber Neighborhood Initiative. And one of the sort of principles that he lived by was be willing to take a risk, but know the risks you're taking. And so, you know, he was very involved in the early years of the Zilber Neighborhood Initiative, up to and including some of the first organizations that we were able to fund over the long term to serve as the key organization, maybe the quarterback, in a particular neighborhood. Um, and so, you know, it was not a surprise when we started out in Lindsay Heights. And Joe was a hands-on kind of guy. He drove, and I drove with him, drove around Lindsay Heights for, oh, I, I think we probably spent hours a day for months at a time going around properties. And he'd say, let's go around that building again and that building. And then he would just sort of brainstorm, here's what could happen in that building. Here's what could happen. He very much was, Dantia, uh, a proponent of the block integrity approach. And his initial idea was, uh, let's build a lot of housing in Lindsay Heights. And my question to him was, how do we know that's what 
residents in neighborhoods want? And the reason that question came immediately to me is partly because I'd been working in philanthropy, but partly because I come out of a not-for-profit human rights background. And the first thing you want to know is how are the people who are closest to the ground, closest to the issue, closest to the condition, how are they affected by it, um, and what did they think ought to happen. And my own experience over the years, and this is how we make a lot of our decisions, has to do with um, listening carefully to what residents and local organizations tell us. They usually can tell you what's been tried before, before you ever showed up on the scene and didn't work. Um, they can tell you who's really doing the, the work, who's really providing the services that are needed, and then who's really just not in the mix in a way that is important and useful. And if you listen carefully to residents and local organizations and then invest in what they really want and stay with it, you actually see some progress. One of the um, really gratifying aspects, I think, for the board of directors has to do with the fact that the quality of life plans that neighborhoods uh, came together and put together, the quality of life plan for Clark Square, the one for Lindsay Heights, the one for Leighton Boulevard West, and those areas, uh, many, if not all, of the projects in those quality of life plans that were put together in 2009, projects are done. They have completed the large catalytic projects or have uh, started work on them and know the completion date. And so if you listen to what neighbors want and you listen to what local organizations can do and you fund their capacity and stick with it, you actually see results. How important is philanthropy to, to building successful neighborhoods? Well, I think philanthropy is an important source of risk capital. Um, I don't think it is an ongoing source of funding, which isn't to say that you don't want to stay in the mix for a long time. Uh, the neighborhoods in which we're focused have been, you know, disinvested for 30, 40, I think you say 50 years in your book, 50 years, and so they're not going to turn mm -hmm. overnight. So there needs to be a sustained investment in communities, but foundations and even corporate giving programs together can't do it alone. The major source of funding in neighborhoods is public funding. And so for me, one of the questions is, when we talk about alignment, when we talk about coming together public, private sector with community residents, how do you take the combined resources and think about aligning those and investing them in very strategic ways for the long term. And often at those public-private partnership meetings, it's the residents who are missing from the picture. So you have your most vital source of knowledge and information not at those tables. So that's one thing, and I'll save the rest. Okay. <laughs> uh, Keith Stanley, let's talk about what Near Westside Partners is doing, because again, this is this is a different component of investment. You have uh, the five anchor institutions I mentioned earlier, large employers on the near west side. Um, they have decided that they are going to try to make um, the near west side uh, an even better place to live, to work. Um, it, this is a, a different way of approaching it. I mean, it, how unusual is it to have anchor institutions playing this kind of role in the kind of work that you're doing? Uh, just a couple of things, Mike. Uh, first, I uh, think that the anchor institutions are absolutely amazing to have five anchors representing about 10,000 jobs in the near side. Of course, beautiful Marquette, where we're at today, uh, rural health care, um, Potawatomi Business Development Corporation, Harley Davidson, and Miller Coors. But I do want to stress, I think, to the audience and understand the, the Avenues West Association, bid number 10, has been around for close to 30 years. Um, what's interesting about that is that our community groups within the Near West Side and our business improvement district, which uh, Patrick talks about in his book about bids, um, have been around for a very long time. And the way I, the way I see it, and um, I hope the board would agree, was that this is a, an addition, a, additional layer to the work we're doing in the Near West Side. Having the anchor institutions begin to take a look at their neighborhood and see the value, the history, the assets, the culture, the tradition, the families, the heritage is within the Near West Side and say, you know what, we want to make sure we continue to grow this neighborhood and support all the, the positive the neighborhood is important. It is somewhat unique. But all across this country, eds and meds, institutions who are committed to their neighborhood have been doing this. We've seen this, whether it's in Indianapolis, whether it's in New York, 
Um, we've seen it across the country, and we're just really taking a model, and our model happens to be that we have these anchor institutions who are committed, and we're using that to do the work we're doing in this community. I, I describe the goal of this, but, but mm -hmm. you can describe it better than I, than I can. Mm -hmm. What is the goal? What, what are they hoping to accomplish on the Near West Side? Two words. Two words. Sustain and revitalize. And it's important that people understand that because when I say sustain, there's a lot of good stuff here. There's a history-rich culture here uh, that we want to keep, but also revitalize. And so we've seen some, uh, due to economic downturns, due to systematic uh, institutional issues, uh, there's been a lot of negative, but at the same time, we want to make sure we, the Neighborhood Site Partners, working with the residents, working with the anchor institutions, are focused on revitalizing those areas, specifically our commercial corridors. Um, so that's important to us. Well, when you say negative, is, is it a crime perception, or is there what's, what, what are you trying to overcome as you go about this work? Uh, Mike, again, excellent question. Really, it's, it's, it's both. It is the actual realities of crime that we still deal with. So Patrick mentioned about that 23rd and State shooting that was here, not too a couple, a couple blocks up from this neighborhood where we're at now. Uh, and so we deal with the realities of that. To, but uh, going on to the earlier panel and some other discussions, um, we're also trying to figure out then how do we deal with the perception. So having the fact that people will look at this neighborhood, well, this neighborhood has this or that, and they don't know. And if you're outside and you're driving and just come to work or you come past through this neighborhood as you're on to your daily activities, you won't see the value that this neighborhood has. You won't see the greatness of this neighborhood. And so we, we deal with that perception because people, you've heard this before, I don't drive, you know, in Milwaukee at night. Well, then you don't know Milwaukee if you're that scared to drive in Milwaukee at night. And so we're trying to work with those perceptions of people. Um, and so that's one of those, is both the realities and the perception of the neighborhood. Ivan, let, let me ask you about that, that question, I guess, is perception. I mean, from a private uh, sector um, point of view, how big an issue is crime in terms of the business decisions that are made by individuals, companies, on um, where to locate? I, th I think um, it's, as far as perception is concerned, I think we're, the perception is not crime, is perception of where you're, where return on investment, and that is where is the best place to, to you know, locate that you're gonna benefit from a lot of different things. Um, I think on, for, I'll, I'll take for example Chavez Drive, and I uh, helped create the Chavez bid in 2005 and been volunteering on it for many years, and we've always, we've always struggled as where our, where our place is in the rest of the marketplace. You know, it was the original Latino community where Latino businessmen, uh, you know, formed and 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 uh, opened up their shops, but as the Latino community moved to all these different places in the city, then you could actually, if you were a Latino consumer, you can go to a lot of different places now. And so I think uh, Chavez Drive then had to deal with, um, you know, uh, perception that it's a little bit dirtier there, a little bit grimier. Uh, there's panhandlers there. There's graffiti there. And so the bid has always tried to address those problems head on, but it's, I think it's a bigger issue than perception of crime. I think it's what is the value of Cesar Chavez Drive to the rest of the city and how, how, can, we make it, uh, how can we make it better? I have always been a, an optimist about, always feel that, uh, you know, as uh, L Latinos, we haven't really had a chance to really make our mark on Milwaukee and yet, there's, we have a lot, we have the potential to do a lot more impact, but we don't have a place to show the rest of the community like, hey, come to Chavez Drive. This is a representation of what the Latino community is. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's quite there yet, um, but I think that's the direction you need to go when we're talking about set perception of crime and safety is, let's tell people what this investment could be. And I guess to go even more, I would just, as far as capacity again, the, the, the bid, uh, and it was all volunteer, we, have a, we had a really small budget. We were, I always felt like I was kind of like drowning on the deep end, <laughs> trying to get things done. And we would have LISC that would help, help augment our budget every once in a while, but we really didn't get things done until the Zilber uh, initiative came through in, in Clark Square, because then I felt like I had an ally on the street, and I know Ian's out there on the crowd, but we, but to do things together, to have a partner in crime, to have other people there to do things, 
and we were able to fundraise and get the statue done that for Cesar Chavez and uh, on there. We were able to get uh, art uh, put on, on the walls and then the buildings. We were able to activate the area. We were able to do the first open streets in Milwaukee. We closed down the street and, and created it for, for all the different neighborhoods to connect by bike. All that stuff was done at when, you know, Journey House and the, uh, the Clark Square Neighborhood Initiative and everyone came to the table because before that we were just, we were just drowning, <laughs> really. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think what, what Ivan describes is the kind of dream and dreams and capacity that you will see grow up when there's sustained investment. When you know that the check is in the mail, when you know that um, there is somebody or a trusted partner who is going to listen to your idea and support that or help you leverage that. When you don't know where the next dollar is going to come from, it, it is a, it's um, like hand to mouth. It, it, there's, it's hard to be thoughtful. Um, the kind of decisions that are made are maybe not the best ones, but they are short-term uh, thinking. And so it gives you the luxury of planning. That's what sustained investment does. I mean, Zilber Initiative, um, the Zilber Foundation invests in LISC in our operations, mm -hmm. and that gives me the opportunity to really think about hiring the people that do the best work that understand that neighbors and residents run their neighborhoods and that we should be working ourselves out of a job every day. <laughs> I mean, that's what we say at our staff meetings. We are working ourselves out of this work. There should be other people in the neighborhoods that we work with who are doing this work. Anybody want to add to that? Did you care to get in on that? Okay. Um, I, want to, I, I did want to follow up, uh, Dancy, on the, uh, uh, the perception issue, though. I, um, I remember your predecessor inviting me to go on a bus ride around town to look at different places that right. were um, that were undergoing, you know, uh, redevelopment. Uh, there were positive signs uh, throughout the city, and, and and this was all part of this this trying to build awareness that there are parts of our city that are are great for investment or or ripe for investment, but haven't had it. Um, is the perception still a big issue for Milwaukee in terms of investing in certain neighborhoods is, from your perspective as, as the new head of LISC, is it still an issue? It, it is. Um, so we all know it costs about $150,000, $180,000 to build a new house. Um, on one side of the river, you can get the appraisal that says, yes, that's what you spent and that's how much it costs. On the other side of the river, uh, the appraisers are not willing to say, yes, you actually spent $180,000 and so it's worth the $180,000. That's perception. That is nothing else. I think um, we do the LISC tours to not only show what's good and allow the residents and the neighborhoods and the practitioners that work with the residents um, to show folks who have the ability to bring investment in, but we do that because we want to show neighbors that the work that they're doing, we're proud of and we value. So it's not, it's not even so much that it's we're bringing money to them as much as we're saying we value what you do and we think that it is important. Um, but could we, could we have more um, opportunity to share stories? Sure. The, the, I hate the nightly news here, I'm sorry. I, I rarely watch it because it is not the truth of the city that I know. I know danger, I'm from Chicago, I'm from Inglewood. I, I'm not scared of much. <laughs> but if I watch the news here on a week, on a, in every day at five o'clock, I, I would be afraid to go out and be among folks. We have to allow the good news to carry forward all the time. It sets, it sets an agenda, it sets an environment, it affects the perception. I want to talk about... Um, I want to yeah, say a please. sentence or two yeah. about perception because I want to flip it a little bit. I learned a very valuable lesson many years ago in the Austin neighborhood in Chicago, talking to a neighborhood leader who ran an organization uh, that now her 
children run called the West Side Health Authority. And we're walking down the street. Uh, we're talking about her block by block organizing program. And she was telling me that it was making a tremendous difference. And I finally just said, Jackie, I don't see it. <laughs> you know? And she said, what don't you see? And I said, I don't see the improvement you're talking about. And she began to tick off the signs for her. Less litter on the street, less litter in people's yards, some of the businesses taking their bars off of their plate glass windows. But she began to just list out for me the signs and signals that neighborhood residents see and understand to be signs of improvement. And I say that just to say, perception really is shaped by both media influences, but also by your lived experience. And so, you know, a lot of times, people who don't live in a particular community can go into that community and think it is in terrible shape. People who live in that neighborhood don't see it that way at all, and in fact, see it as really improving. Here's a little surprising story. At the time that the um, President Trump introduced the skinny budget, um, I was trying to figure out, okay, so what, what are the implications for the organizations that we support and for the foundation? And so I called up 35 of the organization leaders that we fund and said, what's this going to do for you? What's this going to do to you? Tell me, the, tell me what you're hearing. Here are some of the surprises. In some of the neighborhoods, people were really beginning to think about gentrification and to be worried that gentrification was going to take over, not because of the skinny budget, but because they were watching the arena come out of the ground. And so you, for me, it says when we talk about perception, it's whose perception and how do we interpret that? Someone asked earlier, um, you know, about research and sending students in and the, you know, the discussion was, well, come out to the community meeting and, and talk to people about what you're trying to do. As someone who did community-based research, I will add one other thing. Go back to those same community meetings when you have your data and ask people to help you analyze it because chances are you're missing something if you're not a resident of that neighborhood. Hey, uh there are a number of things I want to get to here, but, but you, you raise the, the gentrification issue. And, I, and Keith Stanley and I have talked a little bit about this over the last few months. I'd love to talk about months. that. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there is, I think there, it, it is safe to say that you probably have encountered um, some folks who are longtime residents on the near west side who go, well, you know, this, is this just the way to kind of push me out of the neighborhood mm -hmm. so that uh, the companies can have all their employees live there and they can make their own nice little neighborhood without people like me. Is there, does that exist to any large degree and how do you respond to that? Okay, first thing, there's this great book called Uneasy Peace by Patrick Sarkey, you should read. <laughs> uh, and I'm gonna be a little controversial here. The G word comes up a lot and I have to remind anyone, and most time it doesn't really come from the residents. It comes from the people outside who live miles away and said, oh, you're trying to kick out the poor folks, the black folks. I was like, first of all, unless you're willing to live next door to a 350 um, bed homeless shelter, uh, which a lot of people aren't willing to do, gentrification is not an issue. Here in the Near West Side, we are so diverse. We have 30,000 people who live here, 10,000 are students. Our population isn't going anywhere. In fact, we are welcoming, we're de developing a plan on the board. I see a couple of my board members here, I see Willie Wade there. We are developing a plan to retain our, our renters who want to stay in this neighborhood. When people bring up gentrification, it's a non-issue for me. I mean, really, in the city of Milwaukee, there are maybe some places that see it, but overall, if, if my goal is to work to get a grocery store, to get the amenities that we all enjoy in our community, and we have a small population of people who are willing to come here who make the money and income to, to attract those amenities, I want those folks in, those, in this community. Uh, I know people bring it up about gentrification all the time, but I have to work, at least in the work I do here in the Nairwood side, it's not even an issue. You know, it, we, it just is not, it doesn't register on our, on our, on our radar. You know, I do want to, um say a little bit about the stories that we need to tell. One of the stories we need to tell right in this moment is that it's really about displacement. Whether or not there are steps that are being taken to prevent displacement from occurring, the city and data you can use, uh, an organization um, that 
does data about neighborhoods, are working together on a project that is identifying the early signs and policy, the early signs of displacement, and then what are the policies that can prevent that? So we have this wonderful moment in time where we can say, we, we're, we don't care about the G word. We just really want to have the systems and the policies and the practices in place that prevent displacement. Did you want to get in on yeah, that? no, that's that's exactly um, true, and we agree. It, it, we worry about displacement. Longtime residents um, should have the opportunity to enjoy the amenities that are new to their neighborhoods that they worked really hard, mm -hmm. as Professor Sharkey um, so eloquently um, wrote about. When you've done something well in your neighborhood and then others come in, you should not be displaced. You should have the opportunity to then enjoy it. And so um, we have been very uh, grateful for the opportunity to work with the city on the, their recent anti-displacement um, plan that I guess they'll be talking about um, in a couple weeks. But also um, uh, the idea that people who displace from one place have to go somewhere else. They're not they're not disappearing, mm -hmm. which means that you destabilize other neighborhoods, which is a lot of what goes on in Chicago and a lot of what happens in a lot of neighborhoods where you see a lot of violence you have. Um, brothers don't give up their corners easily, no matter where they are. Um, I think the other thing that, that when we talk about sustained investment, it's not just about housing. It is about investing in people and jobs and opportunity. And so LISC had not really been at the forefront of economic development, but our new CEO is the former um, Commerce Secretary for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and who says, if you have housing and you have um, other amenities, it's really hard to take advantage of that if you don't have a job. And we have not had the kind of job development that we need in these neighborhoods. And so some of our focus now is on how do we create opportunity um, with partners or encourage partners to take the opportunity to create opportunity for those who haven't had it. So I'll give you an example. We have a lot of men that are coming back to our communities um, having been incarcerated, again, as Professor Sharpley um, explain mass incar incarceration. Um, they need money. They are willing to work. Their access to capital is not available. So we have a decision to make here. We either have to develop funds that are going to develop jobs or that are going to fund businesses that these men could have or we are going to have this uneasy or no peace. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at now, how do we, for example, formulate or help groups? We're gonna have a series of um, community organizations we're gonna work through um, looking at worker co-ops. And we see that as a real opportunity. If you have a skill and you've got five or six other folks who have that same skill, perhaps there's an opportunity for you to have a worker co-op. Then it doesn't matter if you have a felony because you're working for yourself. But then where's the money to fund that? That's the sort of risk capital that we have to think um, in a broader way about. We gotta be risk, we have to be prepared to mitigate the risk um, of having people unemployed and, and not working. Did you wanna get in there? Yeah, I, from uh, gentrification, I think the reason why people I think are starting to talk about it more is it's four or five years ago nobody was talking about it because nothing was going on it, overall and it was very slow development and now everyone sees a lot of cranes, sees a lot of things going up. Um, one of the things that you get to see if you take a look at the big picture of Milwaukee is that in the last five years real estate values in some areas have gone up a lot and in some areas have, gone, have declined and a lot of these neighborhoods are the neighborhoods that we're working on the uh, anything west of the freeway has not appreciated in real estate value while everything else is really is really climbing up right now and we have to figure out a way to to bridge that investment from the successful areas and how to put that into into the neighborhoods that we're working in because the other part of this equation is that 
for a lot of uh, the minority population, the Latinos, the, the African Americans, their house is their biggest piece right. of their puzzle for their net worth. And if their biggest piece of their net worth is declining in value, that's not a good thing. And we have to figure out a way to give people a path to say, we should buy a house right here because this is a good investment. Uh, I think right now is we are seeing uh, a period of brown flight as far as Hispanic families that are moving away from the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I almost want to stop people. I tell families, I want to tell families, turn around, go the other way, because uh, Hispanic families are moving further west, further south, and I want them to turn around and see what else is going on. We, um, you know, the city's done a great job in, in doing their planning, and they did their, the streetcar extension lines, and we've seen the opportunities that we have on MLK with the street line and further south in Walker's Point. One of the things that they saw in Walker's Point is that there's a lot of Latinos that are leaving. Uh, I think the, the, the biggest population loss is Latinos in, in Walker's Point. And they're gonna miss the boat on all this increase in, in real estate. And I think uh, all, those, all the big picture investment things that we're doing, we need to look at how do we get uh, families of color to gain wealth in, in the city of Milwaukee. I, I wanna uh, touch on a, the notion that success uh, breeds more success. And so I, I want to ask each of you, for instance, how much pressure there is to demonstrate success uh, fairly early on in an investment? Because it seems to me that the longer you go and you can't show much in the way, the, the less likely it is that others will join in that investment in, for example, a, a neighborhood that needs some improvement. I will say, and it was mentioned earlier in the, in the previous panel, uh, Small early wins are very important. And I think that is important for the Near West Side partners and the work that we do, being able to highlight some early wins. Uh, it was this time, or oh, about six months ago, uh, where we were able to celebrate the success of bringing in a grocery store here at Marquette University campus, um, Syndix. And that's really important to us because it shows that we've been able to do some bigger things. But Mike, I say a, a, a quick story real quick. I see, I think, Janelle Hines from uh, Greater Milwaukee Foundation. Greater Milwaukee Foundation um, supported our gallery night on Valit Street. For those who are familiar with Valit Street, and I see Mike out in there, Valit Street is one of our most struggling corridor, commercial corridors in the near west side. And so we were able to get funding through Greater Milwaukee Foundation to do gallery night. We put this event on, small win just having people come through some of these vacant spaces. I think we work close, you see Martha, we work close with the city of Milwaukee to open up some of these vacant spaces. We did murals, um, had some local artists come. A few months later, uh, we had a couple of people, investors, who were interested uh, in buying, purchasing a property. We had a, a local uh, developer said, I wanna buy a property, uh, let's make it happen. He was able to buy this commercial development. He saw some activity and was excited to buy that. Then we also worked in an entrepreneur, local entrepreneur, Pete's Pops, who was our last year's winner for the Rev Up competition, business competition. He said, I want to go inside that space. And having these small wins equated for me, and I don't want to put words in Mike Cowden's mouth, but an opportunity for a neighborhood that has been struggling for the past 40 years to see something exciting. But it was the equation. It was support, working with Lisk, who helped us get a community outreach person working with all these different partners on these little small wins, and now we have, I would imagine, $250,000, $300,000 development with an actual business hiring people from the community. Now, for some people, that may not be a big deal. I don't know if those baking numbers, I mean, is a large number, but for me to celebrate that success every step of the way, getting those small wins is so important to the work that we do. Uh, quick question, uh, and then I'll get to Susan, but uh, on the issue of crime, mm -hmm. Uh, since the Near West Side Partners uh, formed, since we had these anchor institutions make these investments, what's happened to crime? In this area? We've seen crime decrease in double digits. I hate to keep going back to the book. Uh, uh, Patrick mentioned something I want to, and I'm going to mess it up, Patrick, but I think for every $10,000 that's invested, there's like a $200,000 uh, realization as far as cost savings for, um, for, um, for communities. Uh, the Near West Side, working closely with all our anchor institutions, have, have invested millions of dollars in trying to really do a good job when dealing with crime. As you know, District Attorney John Chisholm here, our Assistant District Attorney uh, Caitlin Rangisma is here, Rangisma. And so for us to see these um, uh, 
this momentum in seeing crime decrease and getting rid of, getting rid of the top three uh, crime properties in the near west side, who each one, or if you combine them all together, had about a thousand calls for service each year. That has changed the landscape for the near west side. Now it's not perfect, I wanna make sure that's clear. I mean, you guys drove in, you drove through, you saw the issues. At the same time, the fact that we we're able to work with our anchor institutions who are putting their money in, but also we're um, working with our partners in Milwaukee Police Department, District Attorney's Office, and others, particularly our residents, we have our own ambassadors, the Near Side Partners Ambassadors, and that's funded through the anchor, uh, the anchor institutions. Having all those key components allows us, uh, when we first started, it was I think close to a 47 uh, decrease, 47% decrease in crime. We've seen some more double digit decreases, but it takes a lot of work. This, uh, the challenge to demonstrate progress? Well, I'll, I'll answer it in a variety of ways, but um, first, one of the things that we're seeing after 10 years is we are seeing interim or pro, you know, program results that are very compelling um, that show that the activities and the projects that people envision for their neighborhoods and have completed have actually produced the kind of results that they expected. So it's those small wins all along the way that make a difference. And then thanks to data you can use, we've begun to see some of the indicators of neighborhood level change um, result as a, you know, increased property values, lower crime rates, those kinds of things that everybody sees as the holy grail, um, we're beginning to see the beginnings of those things. Um, it, for me, I, I want to go back to the definition, and I don't think it was this book, I thought it was Uneasy Peace, in which um, the definition of a durable investment was one that did one of two things, the f or did both things. One was it produced a lasting change in people's lives that translated to a generational uh, uh, improvement so that the adults as well as the kids um, uh, improved. And then the second was that whatever that improvement was, it withstood fluctuations of the economy or fluctuations in funding streams. And so when I think about success, I'm thinking at it thinking about it in multiple levels. Are we beginning to see the results of activities and projects that people believe will, for theory as well as research basis, believe that will make a difference in their communities? And then the second piece of that is, are these the kinds of benefits or changes that are gonna last uh, over time in a neighborhood or in people's lives? And so I think both those notions are important to have in your definition of success. Anybody care to add a, um, take questions in about two Let minutes. me add one other thing. Yeah. We were recently talking with a number of the groups that we fund about, okay, so sh should we do something to celebrate the 10th anniversary? And one of the <laughs> ideas that is actually pretty compelling is to go back and look at the lives of the children who were at the street party where the neighborhood initiative was announced by Joe Zilber. And to find some of those children and ask them what has happened in their lives over the last 10 years. So we just might do that. I hazard to guess we'll see some real success stories in the lives of those kids, partly because their neighborhoods have been improving during the time that they've been growing up. I, I, I um, don't think that sustained investment alone is the only thing that, that will need to happen to continue the peace, um, but it takes policy changes. And so um, I was fortunate to be asked to participate on behalf of LISC for the uh, Blueprint for Peace on the steering committee for um, uh, the Office of Violence Prevention. And so coming up with a blueprint that will look at every, that looks at everything that's happening in neighborhoods and uh, lifts up positive activities and then um, sets out a framework that where we can align I think really is very helpful um, because we don't often think about policy at the same time that we're thinking about the sustained investment. And so having thinking about the violence as a public health, trauma as a public health issue, um, along with, and we're going to spend money in this way, I think will hold us in good stead going forward. Anything you'd like to add? I, um, again, I think that uh, creating common indicators that we can all agree on and say, hey, this is, 
helps us all be on the same rope tugging at the same time. You know, crime is something that we can look at. I think the other thing that we should be paying attention to is is mental health and what we can do to do that. And that was we have, um, I also uh, help serve on a couple of schools. I'm uh, Gus Ramirez's school, St. Augustine and Carmen High School. Both are, are doing great work. Uh, Carmen High School on the northwest side uh, off of Silver Spring is working with West Lawn and working with um, the Silver Spring Neighborhood Center. And uh, one of the things that, and the principal at, at, at one of the schools was noticing, was surprised how, how many of their kids needed mental health referrals uh, and what to do with them. And it came up as an issue in a board meeting. But we needed to we need to figure out. I, I think I think if we can, we need to work on that as a community as well, along with crime, but on mental health issues for for our young kids and figure out how how we as a community can can do that. Can it's work a different kind of investment, isn't it? It's a yeah. different kind of investment. Yeah. Mike, I just wanted yeah. to add to one thing. I, just, I know people will mention about the anchor institutions and other um, assets. I think in general, all of our communities have assets. We have schools, we have parks. Once again, the book mentions a golf club, a golf in place Atlanta. in yeah, Atlanta. Atlanta. Mm -hmm. We all, ha and for people to say, well, you know, Keith, you know, you, you don't understand, you, you have these five anchors. Our home ownership is less than 10%. And Sherman Park is 67%. I know that because I live there. So all of us, we have assets that we can use to, 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 to create the momentum, build the energy, you know, Andre tells about his story, having working with those youth. The, our youth in the community is an asset. And so I just want to make sure that people understand whatever you have. I use the Moses when he was at the Red Sea. He had a rod. And guess what? They crossed the Red Sea. So I think it's important for people to understand that if you, you, there's assets. Don't look at another community where you have this and we, so we don't have. There's things that I don't have in the newer side that I wish I had. I'm glad I have Marquette University to have things like this, but there's things that we don't have. And so I think each neighborhood, each city has a number of assets and things that we can tap into to make sure we can propel it um, when it comes to economic and community development. Let me take a, a few questions uh, before we go. Um, again, if you're in the seating bowl, press down, keep your finger on push. If you're in the back, Ryan will bring a microphone over to you. Yes, sir. Is that working? Yes, it is. We're good. It's a bad echo. Um, this is a. I want to build off something Dante said right there toward the end about the role of the public sector um, and policy change. And it's probably mostly a question for Susan and Keith, uh, but anybody can feel free to dive in. So, with due appreciation for the efforts of the private and philanthropic sectors to address uh, to drive investment in underinvested communities. What responsibility do you think those sectors have for making sure that the kind of investment um, leads to the right kind of policy change? And I'm primarily concerned about economic equality. So living wage, family sustaining jobs in these communities. And just to, uh, without speechifying, to give a little context to why this is such a tangled problem, Sorry to single you out, Keith, but at, you know a couple of the, the anchor institutions on the near west side have opposed um, raising the living wage and have been accused of paying poverty level wages to their lowest paid workers. So can we rely on the private sector to drive the kind of change we want to see in our communities? Or is this instead the proper business? I'm a, I'm a big believer in democracy. Is this the proper business of the public sector? Should we be turning this over to the government to figure this out, democratically elected institutions. Uh, definitely, I'm, I'm somewhat conflicted, and, and the reason I say that, as African American male living in the city of Milwaukee, I think sometimes people come at a point of privilege saying, and we get this all the time, uh, you know, what you really should do uh, in these communities is do this, this, and that. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that sometimes when I talk to brothers and sisters who are right there on 27th in Wisconsin, 27th in Wales, just give me something. And I know it sounds crazy, because people say, no, you want, but some, a, a dollar is better than zero. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I don't want to get it, I don't know the particulars as far as the anger institutions and they're what they're opposed or what they're uh, uh, supporting. But I do know as far as on the ground level, if we can just get jobs to work close to what's again with Willie Wade and Employment Milwaukee and how we can figure it out. I, to me, it's more important to have something that people can at least can grab onto and then climb themselves out of the ladder as opposed to we're going to wait to the perfect dream. And if we don't get the perfect dream, we're going to say the no to everything. I, I'm, I, I'm conflicted by that. Other questions? Mr. Gronick. 
Yeah, I'm Andy Kronick and I'm, run, I'm running for governor. I'm curious from the panel, um, from the durability of the income stream perspective, one of the things that I've been advocating are jobs plans that pay a living wage and pointed to the actual success of graduating people off of government assistance, which has a very real value to taxpayers. What if government came in on the tail end based upon that actual success and invested the real value to the public taxpayer in the kinds of, of programs that were actually going on so you had a reliable source of revenue? Do you think that would work? That used to be the theory in philanthropy that foundations would be your risk capital, would fund pilots and innovative programs, test those out, and that those uh, stronger programs or effective programs would then be funded by public dollars. That, has, that entire paradigm has fallen apart in the last five to 10 years. And so you know, part of what I think is the challenge for all kinds of funders, public, private, corporate, is what's the new way that we have to fund the best work and how do we sustain the investment long enough to see the fruits of the investment? to see the return on the investment. What's the current thinking on the best way? What, what do we think is the well, best way? Well, I, I actually think that there's a lot of discussion both here in Milwaukee and elsewhere about uh, how you bring together all the different kinds of funding sources mm -hmm. to align their resources behind a set of strategies that at the outset are understood to be long-term strategies that are gonna require ongoing commitment. Um, and so I think there is this discussion within philanthropy and other funding sources around um, combining forces. And there is, uh, you know, the Community <coughs> Development Alliance, which several of us are involved with, you know, is explicitly about how do you bring together public funders, private funders, resident voices, and others to think about how you invest strategically in Milwaukee's neighborhoods. I, I couldn't agree more. And I recently, um, I think I saw Julia here, Julia Taylor on uh, Greater Community, um, Greater Milwaukee Committee held a strategic actioning session around neighborhoods and how do we um, catapult the work and the the financial success of downtown into the neighborhoods. Um, and the idea coming out of that was we need to have funding aligned and be prepared to um, support activities into the neighborhoods. Uh, but again, it, um, we have to be prepared to say in your out loud voice that you have to work together. You ha we have to insist that this happens. We don't have enough money anymore where we can afford for everybody to have their own wagon and be you know, heading off on a different trail. We are all going to make this work together or we are not going to see any progress. Well, there is an interesting idea that your, your question introduces, and that is a sequencing of investment. So is there a way that certain kinds of funding leads the way, but other funding comes behind it to sustain those activities? And what do we need at different, you know, at different times in the course of an improving neighborhood or transitioning neighborhood? So in order to get the government to come in the back end, I think you'd have to have really strong civic engagement that would say, here is a product, a process, something that has worked, and this is where we want to see the money or the support going. Um, to the extent that we don't have a level of civic engagement where that uh, elected officials um, appreciate and hear from constituents, then I don't think that that necessarily works. You know, a couple years ago, Alderman uh, Hamilton and Alderman Donovan had a series of uh, public hearings in high schools throughout the city where they inter, you know, they took questions and comments from the general public about crime and violence in their neighborhoods and what needed to happen as a consequence. And among the people who came to these hearings and showed up at a number of them was a group of youth service advocates who stood at the top of a staircase and rolled out a long butcher block of paper to show how much money was going into the police department and then rolled out a tiny little a uh, piece of paper to show how much was going into youth development. It was a very visible way to say, maybe we also need to think about where our public dollars are being spent. This discussion today has raised up for me, if you were going to think about public funding and issues of crime and violence, it's not just 
the police department's budget and resources we should be looking at. We should be looking at all municipal resources, all taxpayer dollars, and looking at whether the taxpayer dollars are being deployed where they're needed and whether the bodies, the physical resources of people are being deployed in this similar way. Because you know, the issues of streets and sanitation are gonna coincide with the issues of crime and there is a real difference between the cleanliness and snow plowing of some neighborhoods and others. So, you know, looking more generally at taxpayer dollars and how they're used might make some sense. I am uh, really hopeful that we will get something similar to what Professor described since we have Assistant Chief um, Banks here. But to think about neighbor stack, you know, I, Harvard pioneered the whole ComStat thing and development. Um, we've had a number of classes around the broken window approach and putting people out in front and being responsible for, for standing up and saying, yes, that window's gonna be done within 48 hours and having it all online so you can look and the public could make a, a, a could be aware and make and, and respond accordingly. But to have all the neighborhood, all the folks who are responsible for what is going on in a neighborhood, if that happened in Milwaukee, that would be something immensely powerful. Yeah. In the places where many of us are, uh, say we're afraid to go or where we know people are working really hard, what if we had something like that? And so part of the work that LISC is doing now is we are really focused very um, keenly on what we can do to support civic engagement. Because that is the only way we're gonna get equitable economic development is if we insist on it. Final word on the subject? Um, I'll answer two different ways. One from my bank hat is that when you, if you're just, if you're doing, you're talking about uh, private institutions writing checks to do to do something we have that's a limited way to do it as far as you know we're, we're a smaller bank we do write checks but we look at the impact of our smaller check and how to do that so we rely on uh, guideposts like LISC because LISC is able to convene the different banks and say hey uh, this is really important we need to help our uh, acre graduates and we need to build capacity to do uh, to help these young developers then we can get the the banks to say hey we can all pitch in and do this together um, from a WIDA perspective um, being uh, the chairman of WIDA I've, I've gotten to see like we're one we're a, a, a top rated high quality uh, uh, authority if you can if you compare us across the board to other state authorities and we do a lot of housing we have a lot of big tools in our toolbox we have this huge bonding capacity that we have uh, and we have a strong balance sheet um, but we don't we're not in the neighborhoods doing the work and in order for uh, the WIDA to bring out its big tools we need to have the partners on the ground that can give us the roadmap of this is how this is how we're going to use your big huge tools to get this done. Um, so we we always need partners to do it, and I would say you you try to get it you try to layer this capital stack of doing projects at the same time. Uh, I I've uh, started the the new market tax credit program for the bank, and that's been a great opportunity to get involved in projects that make a large impact in the community. And when to do a new market tax credit project, you throw everything at it in the kitchen sink. You add city money, you add the, the tax credit investment, you add everything in, and you put it all together, and you, and you try to get it all at once. So my answer is you do it all at once and try to make the largest impact. Uh, did you want 30 seconds here at the end? No, well, yeah, Mike, I just want to say this, and it's, a, it's a really a plug for the business improvement districts. And the bids are... The business improvement district, at least for uh, for the nearest side, is the backbone um, for the work that we do. Without the bid, we wouldn't be in existence. The bid, we collect uh, a tax assessment from the 350 odd businesses in the nearest side, which allows us, and it once again talked about in an earlier panel, allows me not to focus in on trying to raise money to, for salaries and benefits. We can actually go out and do development. There's a there is a model, and you know, Susan, you hit a little bit on this, but there's a model that we need money. To do the work that we're doing and continue to see the successes, we need pools of money coming in from different places. The philanthropic community has a, a piece. Our businesses, government has a piece. Without having all those pieces together, we're limping on. And people expect us, the practitioners who do this every day, to save the world. You can't save the world without the support from your, your groups, your anchor institutions, and your funding partners. 
Uh, that's going to be the final word for this panel. Before we go, I just want to, uh, to say a couple things, and before we thank our panel, uh, what we're going to do is uh, say goodbye to these wonderful folks, uh, but please remain seated. We have an announcement that we want to share with you, and then uh, Professor Sharkey is going to come back on stage, and we're going to spend about 10 minutes uh, getting his observations about what he's heard today uh, from our various panelists. And uh, so stay right where you are. Please do not get up out of your chairs to go get coffee or water. In fact, you cannot leave. You must stay for another 15 minutes or so. Uh, but before uh, we get to this announcement, which you'll want to hear, before we get to that, I want to thank our panelists here, Ivan Gamboa, Susan Lloyd, Keith Stanley, and Denise, uh, I'm sorry, Doncia Stronghill. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Those of you know, who may know me from my past as a producer at Channel 12 can only imagine how weird it is to have Mike Goucher introduce you instead <laughs> of you introducing Mike Goucher. Um, I have a very brief but important announcement. But first I want to say to all of you how wonderful it is to see you and what a great gift you are to us and to one another. So thank you for being here. I told Patrick Sharkey on the way here this morning that I knew that his visits here had meant something to him, but I knew it because I knew he could feel the passion, the commitment, the pride, and the love we have for our neighborhoods and communities. And I can feel it in this room, and I just thank you all for bringing it today. Uh, thank you. Well, if you know much about the Lubar Center, you know we're all about taking social uh, science research, public policy research, and data, and trying to help promote important conversations like the one we're having today. And we thought that Patrick Sharkey's book, Uneasy Peace, gave us another opportunity to try an experiment. It was an idea that came to us from Amanda Seligman, who I want, Amanda, can you stand? She's in the back of the room. Amanda Seligman, who's here at the Marquette Law School as a visiting fellow in law and public policy. She also happens to be, uh, teach history and sociology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and is the head of the history department there. And Amanda had an idea for advancing the conversation from here. So tomorrow when you get your email from me, thanking you for coming and the, the podcast and Alan Borsick's article, um, you're going to get an announcement that we're going to try an experiment of a 90-minute seminar to continue this conversation about the book, the research behind it, about how the findings relate to Milwaukee and some of the challenges you heard from the panelists here. It'll be a 90-minute session. Amanda will lead it. And we are going to limit registration to 20 people, but I'm going to send, as you leave today, if you're interested, I have a handout for you, which we'll give you at the doors. But it's an experiment to see how deeply we can dive into some of these issues in a smaller group setting. So Amanda, thank you for the idea. We look forward to this experiment. We'll see what we learn from it and where we go from there. I want to, now this is a role I'm used to. I want to turn it back over to Mike Boucher. <laughs> Thanks for you. Thanks, Rita, and thanks, Amanda. Um, and again, thank you to Professor Sharkey for, for being with us and for spending the, the day with us today. So, so give me some feedback to, to what you've been listening to this morning. Uh, what did you think of what some of the panelists had to say? Yeah, well, it's, it's great to hear. I have to say there's not, you know, I'm usually talking to academics, and, and so this is really fun, but, you know, I also just want to stress how grateful I am uh, for people taking this stuff seriously and, and for... Um, thinking about what it means here in Milwaukee. And so, you know, to hear about the work that's been going on, uh, whereas I'm doing, you know, the abstract analysis and doing, you know, national stuff, uh, for me, it, it, it's what motivates me to do the work. I always say, you know, the rest of my family uh, are, are public educators, and I, I always feel guilty when I go home because they're, they're the ones actually, you know, working with people and working with kids to make things better. Uh, and I'm doing the, you know, very detached work, but this, you know, 
this is really gratifying uh, to see. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, I think there are, so there, there are too many themes to, okay. to discuss. It's, uh, it's, it's overwhelming, and I didn't have my pen, so I, I, I wasn't writing everything down. But one of the key issues that came up, particularly in this last panel, is just the issue of value, how much value we create when blocks and neighborhoods become safe. And I think the, the key point here is that that value is not all experienced by people who live in the neighborhood, particularly in, in neighborhoods where there's a high uh, proportion of renters, that value extends outward, that it, it goes to, the, to developers, it goes to property owners if they don't live in the community, uh, it goes to property taxes, it goes to the city as a whole. And so the work that's been going on on the ground is primarily changing the daily experience in, uh, of the individuals in that community but it's also generating substantial value for the city uh, and for the state as a whole, much of which does not go to the residents of, of that neighborhood. The reason I bring this up is because we often think about neighborhood transformation and dealing with violent crime as problems that residents in that neighborhood have to deal with, okay? And we often ask people to volunteer uh, their time and their effort to deal with those problems. Well, I'm never asked to volunteer my time. Uh, I'm never asked, you know, by people in New York City uh, to volunteer, give me some hours and go and, and see what you can do to reduce violence in Brownsville. Um, and I bring this up to make the point that those doing this work, those working on the ground and the residents they're working with, they have a, a uh, a strong justification for going to the city, for going to foundations, for going to the state and say, we're not just creating value for ourselves and our, our neighbors, we're creating value for the city and we wanna be compensated for that. We deserve some of the resources that are being spent on crime uh, and violence and poverty. Um, you know, it's not charity. Uh, it's not feel-good dollars that go to, to residents. This is the work. The, the people who are on this panel have the greatest capacity to control violence and the residents that they interact with. And we have never thought of organizations like these as the solutions to, to violent crime. Okay, We naturally think of the criminal justice system. We naturally think of the police. Uh, we, we actually know that residents and, and community organizations have that capacity. That's been demonstrated over and over. Uh, what's needed is the commitment, the commitment to make those organizations sustainable, uh, the commitment to pay residents who are volunteering their time uh, to go out at night and, and do an autopsy, social autopsy, and figure out why an incident occurred, uh, people who march on the street against violence, people who build homes, uh, people who are painting the, the shutters on that abandoned home in Imani. Um, uh, they have a legitimate call for public resources, uh, and, but they've never had that commitment. I, I have to ask you this question. So you, you watched the two panels. You, you, you saw eight people there uh, who are eight of literally hundreds in this community who are very committed to making this a better place. They do good, important work every day. Do we have any idea why a city like Milwaukee, despite all that good work, still hasn't seen some of the crime declines that we see in some of these other cities? What, what do, is at play here? Is it anything that we control? Yeah. Um, well, I think they are having an impact. You know, if I had to place a bet and, and do the most rigorous random assignment trial for, for the work that, that's been going on with We Got This and, and, and the other organizations, you know, I, I would bet a good amount of money that they are having a strong impact on, on crime. I think that issue is, and, and you know, I don't want to disparage anyone who's not in the room, but we're, we're selecting on people who are successful. You know, we're selecting on the organizations that have been here for a long time, who have dynamic leaders, uh, who have shown that they are extremely effective. We're selecting on uh, the groups that are uh, present, and, and we're missing the, the sections of the city uh, that are absent. So I think the dominant feature of urban policy generally, whether it's federal policy or even local policy, is that it's temporary. 
Uh, it's unstable. And so there are lots more organizations that come up and you know, then the person gets a job in Chicago and is gone. Uh, uh, there are lots of organizations run by really competent people, uh, but their funding runs out. Um, and and you know, the work they're doing gets diluted or, or disappears. Uh, so I think the, the challenge here is to take these stories, stories these very you know, inspiring stories and these success stories and, and see what else is happening. Uh, go to every block that doesn't have uh, um, a, a highly successful and stable organization and figure out who's in charge on that block, if anyone's in charge. Um, figure out why there are organizations that, are, that haven't been sustained over time. Um, and I think, you know, once we have a, a more comprehensive view of, of what sustains community organizations, uh, which blocks have a community quarterback, which ones don't, uh, who's in charge in every, every block across the city, then we can have a better answer as, as to why there hasn't been a complete uh, 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 transformation of the city and why there are still neighborhoods that feel abandoned or that, that feel uh, like they don't have that foundation of institutional strength that is necessary in order to deal with the problem of violence. So here's my final question. Um, and, and I remember two years ago when you were here, he, Patrick was talking about his book, uh, Stuck in Place, which looked at uh, we haven't made a, a heck of a lot of progress towards racial equality in this country, at least we hadn't up until that point in time, maybe still so today. Uh, you were telling me at that time that you were thinking about something on the crime <laughs> decline. It was something that was in, fresh in your mind, that's what you were going to work on, so what's next? What, what, does this lead to something different or more in this direction? What, what are you thinking about? Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, so Think about you got to teach a class today or something I have to, like that. I have to Skype in to teach my class tomorrow because <laughs> there's a snowstorm. Um, so uh, right, I've been convinced uh, the more and more work I've done on violence, I've become convinced that it is the fundamental problem of cities, M meaning not that the other problems are unimportant, but that nothing else can happen if a neighborhood is unsafe or if a city is unsafe. And why this is, we've, we've heard, you know, because a family uh, will not invest in a community if they're worried about raising their kids uh, in a violent neighborhood. Uh, developers will not invest in a, in a community if they're worried about their investment. Business owners won't set up shop. Uh, um, if, if, and then residents won't venture out into public space. You know, libraries won't work if people are not willing to go out into public space and, and, and visit a library. So um, the more and more evidence, uh, the more and more research that I've done on this question has, has convinced me that violence is actually the crucial question, the fundamental question uh, for understanding urban inequality. Uh, so, I, you know, this is, this is the first piece, but right now we're, we're doing uh, a national data collection just so we can get more uh, uh, precise and updated data on different forms of violence all over the country, uh, a, a lot, or I shouldn't say all of, in the top 100 cities, in the largest 100 cities. Um, and then, you know, I want to get into intervention work. Um, I want to, to understand how programs like Neighborhood Stat, which has come up a few times, um, whether they can scale, whether they can go to different cities uh, and be effective. I think there, there is, there's a ton of stuff going on, and then, uh, you know, we've heard it here in New York City, the same is true, um, but there are also principles uh, from, from the research that I think can be extended. So I want to work with the community groups that are, that are uh, doing the work on the ground, um, not just in an evaluation sense, but to, to try to translate some of these ideas uh, in, into programs, into new investments. Um, and, and so that's, you know, most of my energy uh, beyond the, the piece devoted to my kids and, and uh, being chair of my department and that kind of thing is devoted to uh, data collection right now and imagining the types of interventions that have a, a chance to transform neighborhoods. Uh, I'm going to wrap things up there. Before we go, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who attended this event today. Thank you so much for your interest, your attention, your good questions, uh, your, your thoughtful observations that are made either in this room or outside this room to others who have gathered here. Thank you so much for that. We greatly appreciate that and glad that uh, you found uh, the material and the conversations today uh, to be of interest. Um, 
Mostly I want to uh, thank our panelists who, who were terrific today. I thank them for their, their uh, very thoughtful uh, uh, comments on some of the challenges and opportunities we face. Uh, and I want to conclude by thanking Patrick uh, personally. Again, uh, the weather was not great, is not great in New York City today. He's got one kid who's at home. He's got another kid who's at school. They have another nor'easter. It's, it's springtime in New York, isn't it? Um, <laughs> But so he, uh, he made some uh, changes to his schedule so that he could be here, and, and we are grateful for that. If you uh, are interested on the way out, uh, you can pick up a signed copy of his book. Um, they are for sale out there in the lobby. And having said that, I want to thank uh, the author of Uneasy Peace, The Great Crime Decline, The Renewal of City Life, and The Next War on Violence, Patrick Sharkey, for being with us today. Patrick, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.